So welcome everybody to this uh, perhaps day long, we'll see how it goes, workshop of Intermediate R with Simon Wellesley Miller. I'm very excited because uh, there's a lot of interest. I had a sneak preview, so um, it's really interesting and great to see lots of code in the intermediate realms of R. Um, so I'm going to pass you over to Simon to introduce yourself properly and also start the workshop. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. I don't think I do anything properly, so I don't know about instruction. <laughs> Hello. Uh, second part is don't panic. There were no uh, initial course materials or anything sent out beforehand. We're going to do all of that as you go along. So that's really, really cool. Um, but I would suggest that you use Posit Cloud. I'm going to be using it just so that we're all using the exact same version of, of R, which makes things a lot easier if we're sort of troubleshooting and uh, not having to fight with local IT issues uh, because you've got local IT issues because um, because of local IT. Um, so I would definitely suggest you use Posit Cloud. Um, I think somebody can pop something in the chat to the link to that. That'd be great. You can log in with uh, an existing Google account or you can set up an email and, and do all that. And hopefully if you start doing that while I start wrapping it on and doing my very, very brief introductions to me. Uh, so a little bit about me and my sort of our journey. So uh, my name is Simon Wellesley Miller. Um, I work for NHS England and currently work across two teams. Uh, I work in the Southwest Intelligence Insights team and also the National Elective Recovery Insights Cell. Um, so this work kind of spans, um, so I do a bit of performance work and I do a bit of data science work, so a, a bit of each. Um, I've been working for NGS England now for uh, nearly two years, blimey, uh, and last year graduated from my master's in healthcare data science. Uh, prior to that, I worked for a local mental health provider, so I have worked out in the provider and I think I worked there for about seven years. And prior to that, I worked for the police and local council doing child protection data. And I think I worked there for around about five years. Um, and before that, did all manner of very, very weird and wonderful jobs from being a prosecutor for the DVLA for uh, naughty people who hadn't paid their car tax. Um, I was a costume designer for film and theatre, and I looked at my my best ever job, which I got paid the most for in my entire life, was being a goblin handing out leaflets for which I got 250 quid a day, cash in hand, no question asked, uh, which was a fabulous week. So, uh, yeah, if there's anybody who's got any really good goblin work, I'm your man. Uh, so that was cool. Anyway, back to data. Um Going back to my uh, sort of council days, really, really Excel based, massively Excel based reporter. We would we would use business objects to download individual single tables and then do VLOOKUP upon VLOOKUP upon VLOOKUP to build our reporting. So we would download all the children's data and then download all the children's ethnicities and then do a lookup and then download all the ages and then do a lookup and then do something else and then do a lookup. Uh, which ba basically meant there were two of us doing the, the child protection data and we would report quarterly a quarter in arrears because it would take three months to build the reports for three months ago, which is just bizarre looking back on it because I get chased if I'm like, oh no, you spent to set this out by two o'clock and it's now quarter past two, outrageous. So yeah, really, really weird different time scales and stuff. So anyway, so uh, yeah. Um, I then moved to the police and got my very first site of click view and coding and saw what an absolutely crazy game changer that was. Um, and then I, I was in there for a few months and then I moved to the NHS and started learning SQL. Um, something I probably really struggled with to start with, but kind of got reasonably OK. And uh, I guess my knowledge is still kind of waning, OK, but kind of waning a bit. And uh, I must admit, after learning R and Python, when you go back to SQL, it's a bit of a, uh, bit, of a bit of a struggle. Um, so my R journey, um, I guess that sort of leads back to a sort of planning round where we, in, in my trust, where we were looking at referrals and our, our, our forecast was basically look at last year's and add 5%, which, um, you know, that's not a very robust forecasting method. And I knew there were better ways of doing forecasts. And I also knew there was like better things we could do with our data. You know, I know if I went on Amazon and I bought something, Amazon would say, hey, do you want these sort of similar items? So I knew there was some 
cleverer stuff out there that we 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 could do with data. So I kind of started dipping my toe in R and doing some really really simple sort of like seasonal deconstructions and and, and stuff. Um, but was really really lucky at that sort of stage after sort of teaching myself some really really basic stuff to sort of hook up with the the early quite early um, R community and you know just start getting that really better steer. Um, I think from that I. I don't think I ever actually did the introduction to our course that the NHSR did. However, we did do the uh, train the trainer course on how to do the course. And I think that's the first time I met you, Zoe. Um, when was that? That was like a good few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then it sort of became sort of train the trainer. And I think I sort of placed that. I think I've, oh, goodness knows how many times I've done it, but I think it's about 500 odd people I've uh, chucked through the course. So that's, that's really good. So really keen on that course, but, I guess this course was something about how do we how do we take that and and look at sort of next steps from that course. Um, again, sort of again, my journey. I guess I'm really really fortunate being based in Exeter because a it's Exeter and that's awesome. But also have sort of Penn Cord who were running some sort of training courses around some operational research stuff, um, and managed to get onto a very very early version of the the HSMA program. If you're not aware of what the HSMA is, I'll definitely sort of send out links after that. That's sort of health service modeling associates where they're really trying to get some sort of basic operational research technologies and skills into sort of uh, performance work. Um, so like I so said, happy to sort of send out links how to do that. And that got me really infused into sort of, sort of data science and that sort of operational research. And as I said, I uh, then went on to take my master's directly in healthcare data science and uh, trying to do a full-time job and a part-time master's. So yeah, all good fun. So that's kind of where we where we are now. So just going on to this course, um, very much it's going to be a, uh, a monkey see, monkey do. There's going to be a, basically I've got a massively long script, it's about one and a half hours in lines, and we're going to run through it together. Some of it will just be running what's on the screen, having a look at it, what it does, and that's, that's brilliant because I'm just going to say, hey, look at this function, it does this, and that's just great. And that's just, you know, there's not much more learning to do. And then there are bits where we say, like, over to you, we've done this, can you sort of pull those things together and, and put them together? So, kind of assuming that you've got a, uh, a reasonable base knowledge of R, it was kind of designed that if you've come off of the introduction to R, then you could, as long as you were kind of quite happy with what you were taught there, we could fall into in, into the stuff today and hopefully that will all make sense. Um, however, you know, let's make mistakes. Everybody learns from the mistakes. That's how I've managed to learn so much by making so many mistakes. So that's absolutely cool. Um, if people get really, really stuck. I mean, it's a great idea that, you know, we should share on screen where the error is, have a look at the error message, and then see if we can sort of dig, debug it between us. Because um, again, that's a really good learning opportunity for the, for the class, as it were. So if you make a mistake, it's not that you've failed, you've deliberately made a learning opportunity for the rest of the class, which is, you know, a fabulous thing to do. Well done you. So let's all make mistakes, although obviously not too many. Um, at any point, do feel free that you can just stick your hand up or just shout out, Simon, shut up. I'm stuck here. Um, you've got free will to say, Simon, shut up. Otherwise, I will just keep blabbering. Um, time wise, we've, oh, well, I've not run this course. I've kind of run a very early version of this course before. Um, and that was kind of, we got through it on a day. I've tweaked things around a bit and sort of updated a few bits in here and there. So I've got no ideas whatsoever about timing. Um, thankfully, I've got a really weak bladder, so we will be taking lots of breaks. So that's that's fine. I'm going to be drinking lots of coffee. So that would be great. So we'll make lots of uh, breaks. Um, I would aim for sort of half an hour, 45 minute lunch, not too long, because I'd rather just we jug through as much as possible uh, and get stuff through at the end. And, you know, do feel free to start, you know, if there's anything that we're not sort of covering that you really, really, really want to sort of pick up on and, and sort of ask that's a sort of spin-off, either put it in the chat and we can sort of pick up on that. Um, any questions, you know, like I said, do pick up, 
put your hand up. We've got Zoe here who's going to help us and sort of uh, also try to monitor the chat. If there's any sort of questions there, she will try to sort of pick up on those. Um, but likewise, you know, happy to say stop and, you know, come back to you and we'll sort of answer things as we go. So, uh, so I've got no idea of timings. We will, we will wing it and uh, see where we get to. So let me share my screen um, and uh, get going. Are there any questions or bits and pieces before we get going? My goodness me, there's like 17 things. In We've just been talking about the cloud, so that's fine. No Don't worry. worry about that bit. Okie dokie, let me work out how to share my screen. Where's share screen? Where's share screen? Uh, da, da, da. Da, 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 da. There is a question, sorry, about the data. So you're going to share scripts, but yes. is there data for today? Uh, yes, they are. Yes, there is. And it's in the scripts, which we will come to. So am I? I'm not sharing, am I? That's the button. That's the share button. Is that all right? Okay. Yeah, I can see your what can screen. You see? Which one? With the blue, the, the NHS England IT details what? are on there, which is nice. <laughs> but, uh, your but, cloud my, screen, yep. Yeah. Let's go into Posit Cloud. Do, 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 do. Make that screen there. So I've got a bunch of uh, stuff in my uh, uh, workspace. Hopefully everybody's got to a workspace, just either it's going to be blank or if you have used our studio before, uh, our cloud before, it might have a, a previous project. But we are going to create ourselves a new project and we are going to create a new proj project from a Git repository. So we want to click on that one and it will ask you for the URL. And if I can find Zoom again, uh, where's the chat gone? Oh, I can pop it there, but I don't know where the chat is. I've lost it. Can you put it in the chat, Zoe? I, I can try and find it because I'm just oh. getting to your GitHub because we found it yesterday, didn't I? Oh, I've got a different Simon. <laughs> oh no! We have. <laughs> and, uh, going, you, you need you need a different um a <laughs> different name, don't you? <laughs> oh dear. So there are two. Uh, oh, there's the chart there. I found it. Oh, you found it. Brilliant. Yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. I found it too. So if you copy, there we go. So the chat's on that screen. I'm looking at you on that screen and my stuff's on that screen. So no problem whatsoever. Uh, cool. So if you've uh, popped that in there, we've got new R Studio project and OK. Should be as simple as that. So hopefully that's come up with something and you've got a R studio arrived and you should have a bunch of files over here in the plot. In the plot? In the in the file explorer. That's the word I'm now. Everybody with us there. Okay, I'm assuming that's okay. And if we just click on the intertrain underscore student version r that will bring us up our data oh our, not data our script let's drink some coffee that would help. so let me just pop so uh i'm starting a new project absolutely clean same as you guys are so there is also uh, an intertrain version, which is the uh, the version I will be cheating because I've already prepared all my answers for all the bits. Uh, so I will also have that one up and running as well. But obviously you guys don't do that. 
rabbit cheat. So we all got there. Any problems? I'm assuming not. So this is the version we want to be using. Uh, just to sort of say, uh, obviously, this has automatically come up with a few little... Uh... Sorry, Simon, for interrupting. Uh, can you just remind me where did you add this G, G -hub, G Hub address? I can't remember. If from your workspace, how did you manage to put the address to pull this information from? Right, so let's go back to here. If you do new project... New, uh, new project. New right. project from Git repository. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. that allows you to put that URL in there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And hopefully that will come through and you'll have all the uh, the code will be there. And if you click on the student version, that should come up. So a couple of sort of simple things probably should do that to start with. Obviously, we were using a couple of data sets and sort of we're going to do some plot the dots. So we're going to do janitor. We've not got those installed before. Um, so yeah, the quickest and easiest way is just to press it's install and let's get those installing uh, in the background while we're working, which is quite a nice way of doing things. Uh, just a reminder uh, around the help functions because you know we all need help and that's uh, really, really useful is that you can hover over a function and press F1. Um, so basically just click on a function name uh, so if you've got uh, call names, you'll know what that does. You can just click on it and then press F1. That will bring up the, the help screen. Likewise, in the in the console, you can put a question mark and then the function name. That will also bring it up. You can also search for it within the help tab. Or obviously, there is also our friend, Mr. Google, which is also quite useful. So that uh, we've just hopefully pressed the install button and that's sort of chugging through and has done a bunch of installations, which is great. Hi, uh, hi Simon. I'm so sorry. Which was the one that we had to install again? Apologies. So if you do enter train student version, yes. and it usually comes up with a little bar at the top here. Yes. So just click install and it should then install them all. Um, click install. Apologies, could you just show me where you click again? Uh, it won't show up for me now because I've done it. Let me just. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I've seen it on the top. Apologies, I found it. Yeah. <laughs> well, should yeah. have. Yeah, it's working. Thanks. That's that's checking way through. Um, okay, so, okay, so just sort of just vaguely, uh, so I've written my some notes. So I've written all my sort of speaking notes in the code as well. So you can you can read back a bit at a later point and imagine my dulcet little tones in, in there as well. But basically what we're going to do today is a lot of data wrangling. Um, I think there's a lot of lots of really lovely tutorials around sort of um, uh, charts and tables and bits and pieces, although I would like to do a, a bit of a masterclass on tables at some point. But there's loads of resource around those things. What's, what's trickier is some of those sort of more sort of wrangling techniques that we sort of have to do on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis. So that's more of the stuff that I'm going to be covering today, although we will do a little bit of SBC. Um, again, I'm not quite sure how long people have been using R. Um, so, so some people use old style pipes. Um, throughout this tutorial, I'm going to be using new style pipes. Um, they are interchangeable at the moment. There's there's sort of no difference between them. And I guess it's also being aware that if you are a newer, you know, you're newer to R and you've just seen sort of the new pipes, that if you do go onto Stack Overflow and you start seeing lots of these old pipes that you don't go, oh, what does that mean? What's that doing? They're exactly the same. So they're absolutely interchangeable. So don't worry about those. So that was very much obviously we opened up a, a script our studio does this lovely little thing where it sort of flicks through sees what libraries it's got checks if they're installed and then comes up automatically in our studio to say uh what what's going on there is there a shortcut for the new pipe yes there is but i don't know what it is um some people will answer that it's the uh, same is it the same mm. which is what? i'll write instructions how to get to the new pipe though 
Um, an alternative way that we can uh, do a check and install. So sometimes uh, we sort of hand over a piece of code and they're not necessarily going to be using it in our studio. So that check to see whether you've got a library installed um, or not is very much in our studio things. There are occasions though where you might be using sort of base R or somebody might be using VS code or something else. So what we can do, we can actually create a little script which basically does exactly the same. So we're going to be using something called NHSR data sets today. Um, so somebody asked about data, is there sort of data that we're going to be using? So NHSR data sets is basically a, a little R package which the NHSR community has put together, which has basically got some data sets in it. Um, just they're all sort of dummy data sets, sort of pseudo um uh, pseudo data sets based off of real data um, but it just means we've, we're all going to sort of work off the same data etc so this little uh, this little script is a little if statement we will come on to if statements later but it's basically saying if we require the NHSR data sets as in it's not installed then install the package um, and then pull in the package so we will need to run this script we don't have um, data sets installed and we don't have tidyverse installed. So it should hopefully then load in those two packages. So it should be able to run those. So now we have NHSR data sets installed. Uh, we can basically pull through some data um, and well, you know, that obviously makes things a lot easier. Let's just put that down is my screen here big enough let's just make my script a little bit bigger for people because i know that's uh where are we appearance that's where it is i'll just make this a little bit bigger so that's where we're going so that should then just check whether our libraries are installed and install them if they're not installed and if they are installed, it will not install them. It will just basically straight call the library. And we'll come to that later. So we're going to start off and we are going to make ourselves a data frame. So this AE attendances is an object within our NHSR data sets. So if we pull that through, we've now got a data set of uh, some data. So let's have a look at that. So there's various ways we can have a look at it. Um, I usually default to uh, just clicking on the data here and that will do us a view data. And hopefully one day that will turn up. So um, this is the data set we're gonna be using today. It's really, really simple. It's, it's nothing terribly exciting. So basically it is um, a time series uh, across different sites, which is our organization codes. We've got a, uh, a type of one, two, and other. And then we've got a number of attendances, breaches, and admissions across these uh, across these areas. So we've got number of type one admissions for RF code one for uh, March 17, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't think there's anything particularly exciting in this data set. So you know, we know we can sort of just scroll through it. Um, we can see there's sort of certain organization codes have may only do certain types. We do have some uh, breaches and emissions where there just aren't any for certain types, etc. We do not have any uh, null values, which is good to know. So it's a relatively clean data set. And that's what we're going to be playing with today. Is there any questions on the data set? I've tried to make the data set as absolutely as clean and simple as possible, but we will be doing some quite interesting things to it. So that was one way to have a look at the data and we can close that down. Uh, another way that we can uh, call the data, and I love this because I only recently found it, is that you can press the control key and click on data. And that will also... I don't know, it doesn't work in our studio quite the same. Oh, that's really annoying. Uh, no, that calls out the function. That's really weird. Okay, that's really odd. Um, no, okay. In my desktop version of our studio, if I press control and click on the um, 
on the, on the name of the object, it will bring up the object. But in our Studio Cloud, it seems to do something weird. Okay, I'm going to move on and not worry about that. So uh, sometimes I've got a really big data frame and I can't remember what all the column names are called or or is more likely as I'm halfway through writing a function and I can't remember what I've called a certain uh, a column name and it's not coming up in the autocomplete for whatever reasons because the autocomplete doesn't always uh, play ball in all circumstances. So let's just do some really nice useful base R functions. So one that really, really I like is uh, call names. If we run that, we can just get a, uh, a list of the column names in our data set. What I usually do is I'll be in the middle of writing some sort of function up here that does that select. And I'll be like, oh no, what's the column name called? So I will then go down to here, uh, write call names and bring up the column names here, uh, which is again, really, really useful to be in the middle of something. And then I can carry on and go, oh yes, it's org code. That's what I want. Um, so, yeah, call names really, really useful for for seeing what's in there. Uh, another bit of database R. Um, so, if we just want to select one column, we can do data and then dollar sign and then one of the column names. So, if we look at data dash uh, dollar sign type, it will bring through all the data for that uh, column, um, which is really, really useful for certain things. So say, for instance, we just wanted to get a list of all the unique data items within our variable. We can call a unique function and call it across our data set. And then that will just give us our unique, um, what are our unique values within that column. So in that column, all we've got are one, two, and other, um, which is, yeah, really, really useful. And let's like say that little dollar sign comes in quite handy. Um, so yeah, basically that, that dollar sign allows us to call a column and it turns it into a, a vector. It's also possible to specify a specific entry within that vector uh, with, with square brackets. So here we've got our big long vector. Let's just have a look and say we wanted to call just the fourth item in our vector. So one, two, three, four, and we want to call that number one we can just do data type and then square brackets and it will return our one. Again, is, is quite useful. And you can also do things like have uh, colons and we can call the fourth to the 10th entries if we so wish. And that would bring our one to other, 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 other. Um, so yeah, definitely a note to Python users if there are any, uh, R starts counting at one and uh, yeah. Uh, so if there are any Python users, that's quite a bit of a, a, a headspace change. And it does include the end item as well. So slicing in Python works much, much, much differently in that you start counting at zero and it doesn't include the last. Oh, it's just yeah. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so do do not mess up your slicings between R and Python. So, uh, so that's really quite useful if we just want to pull through stuff. Um, Obviously, that's very dependent on how your data is arranged and sorted. So it's not a great way of, of doing things dynamically. However, if you just want like a quick and dirty way of doing things, it's it's quite good. There are some other nice things. So if you just want to know the number of distinct entries you've got, you can do an N distinct and that will tell us there's three. That might be more useful, say, if we did N distinct instead of the type, if we did that on the org code, that would tell us how many organizations we've got within that data set. So we've got 274 different organizations uh, in that data set, which again, if you just want a really quick count of uh, of what's going on, that's that's really, really helpful. Um, uh, range is a, is a really nice little mini function as well. So if you just want to get the range of a variable, uh, let's say really, really useful for dates. So if you want to know uh, on our period, what's the start date, what's the end date, we can pull that through. And um, yeah, really good when you've just got that, you know, quick and dirty data set that you've just got in and you just want to make sure that you've uh, encapsulated everything. So again, really, really nice. Um, 
str data so that gives you the structure of the data so that's again really really nice uh little uh little feature you can pull up more or less the same here in our studio when you uh, click on the little arrow here in fact that is virtually identical but it'll basically just allow you to check your date types uh you know with your is your date down as a date type is it have we got the right factors and and uh our, all our numbers actually come through as a numeric very very important to check your dates that your dates have come through as dates because um because of dates i will explain factors a little bit more later in the course and we will have a look at those and obviously we just want to make sure that our numerics are numerics which is cool so on there so uh another really quick quick and dirty thing we can do uh, around our data is if we just want to have a look at the top five rows so a classic sql would be a you know select top 10 star from uh, we can do the equivalent with with head data which uh don't do that do that and we can just pull up very very quick table on our on our console of our the, the top five rows of data we can also look at the bottom five rows so we can do a tail and that will allow us to sort of have a look at the tail uh, we can also specify within our head function, if we didn't want five rows, we can pull out 15 rows. So you can just do a, a comma 15. It's probably not good because I'm not here. Uh, yeah, and we can see we've got 15 rows of data. So uh, that's very much a, a base R way of doing things. We can also, there's a sort of a dplyr version of, of head and tail, which work a little bit nicer and you can also feed those into sort of more deep library type stuff so we can do top n data 15 which will do exactly the same um another th nice thing we can do is a top frac so basically rather than saying we want to see the top 15 uh entries we say we can want to see the top 15 percent of entries so if you want to take a sample of your data and you just want to pull through the the first 15 percent uh you don't then have to calculate how many rows uh you've got and then do all that manually you can do a top frac and that will pull through uh the top uh top fraction of the data so apparently 15 percent of our 12,765 is 1906 um, i'm going to take its word for it uh, which is cool another thing you can do is you can actually add in a uh, a variable into our top frac so say we wanted to see the top 15 percent based on attendances so at the moment it's literally just pulled through our um uh, just our top 15 rows full stop but actually, if we want to order it by our attendances, so we've got through the top 15% of attendances, we can pull that through and then we come through there. And these guys are our top 15%. Um, just a note, it doesn't order them for you automatically. It just pulls them through. I don't know. I guess it does its calculation in the background, has a look at it and pulls it through. So... You've listened to me rabbit on for, for five, 10 minutes. Um, so that's that's really good. So over to you. Um, see if you can find the lowest five attendances and so work out if you can work out how that works. It's a bit of an odd one. Clue is we're going to be using the top N function, but it will bring through the bottom five. That's a really horrible first question I'm asking you. I'm really sorry. I think I must have done that backwards because I thought we'd covered the bit that we're doing so yeah, my apologies. This is a really horrible question. So I'm not going to dwell on this one. So uh, we can do our same our top n we're happy with. We want to run it across our data, so that's easy. 
Not sure quite what we want to put there. And we want to do uh, attendances. So instead of finding the top five, we want to find the bottom five. So uh, basically, we can put in a minus five, and that will work kind of backwards. And that will give us our lowest number of attendances. Does that make sense? Again, likewise, they're, they're not sorted. OK, sorry, that was a really cheeky question for your first one, uh, which was really not fair, because I think we do some minor stuff further down, and I must have jumped backwards. So my apologies. Uh, so let's see if we can see uh, the summary statistics of a data frame which is the amazing uh, summary function. So if we just look at the summary of our data, uh, which is a really, really fabulous uh, little, little uh, function and works across a large number of different things, um, especially if you get into things like linear models and things like that, summary function is just the bestest thing in the world. But basically, uh, again, uh, this is really, really, really useful for just that really uh, initial look at your data set. So you can just do a summary data. It will run across all of your, um, uh, across all of your features and basically tell us um, for a date period, it will tell us the min and the max, which is useful. I'm not sure quite how it works out the mean and the median, I guess uh, that that works. And obviously I guess it works uh, for your quartiles just to work out where the sort of the quarter points are um, in your data set, which again is really, really useful to make sure that those are sort of symmetrical in your head, which would tell you if you've got uh, sort of data missing. I had a lovely instance a couple of weeks ago where I was loading in sort of like five years worth of data and just one of the years in the middle had just gone, wasn't there. So I just eyeballed my data and looked at the start and go, yeah, it starts at the right end, scroll down to the bottom and went, yeah, it stops at the end. So uh, it took me it took me far too long to understand that I'd had a year in the middle there missing. So, um, yeah, uh, for where you've got um, individual counts of things, it will give you a count of things. It will only give you sort of a, a high level summary. So if you want to do a specific count, of how many org codes we will come back to that in a minute and then it will tell us our, our counts across other features so we've got 4932 type ones that many type twos and that many others and likewise well we've got numerics it will tell us our min our max our mean and median and our, and our quartiles again really really helpful to uh, understand what's there our data that set doesn't contain any uh nulls or nas but if it did they would also appear within that summary. So again, really, really useful, you know, function just to run across your data, especially if it's a new data set that you you haven't really sort of pulled before and it's sort of aided into you, just to kind of get a look and feel of of, of what's going on. So uh, looking back to uh, our, our quick uh, functions. So again, a really other really really nice function is the table function. So basically, if we wanted to get this kind of just count by uh, data uh, and our types, and we just wanted to get a count of types, we can run table data dollar type, and it will tell us how many there were. So I was saying it would be interesting to see how many um, org codes we've got, not org code. Uh, so if we did table org code, it would give me a big table of all the different providers and tell me how many times they each appear within the data set so we can see that some some of our um some of our provider codes have have submitted more than others some are quite incomplete and some of them only appear to have one entry in there so again if you have something and you just want to check that you've got the right number of submissions or whatever for each or code it's a really 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 quick and easy way of um of, of running that through uh, the other thing you can do in the table function is you can run it across two features. So if I wanted to do uh, a data type and the organization code, I can run through and I can then see 
by each of my uh, types, my one, two, and others, by each of the different providers, how many times they've submitted data for each of those different types. So I can clearly see, hopefully here and say here, where we've got specific one, twos, and others, et cetera, and what those look like. So I'm guessing I'm looking for a nice 36 across each of those, which means they've got a submission for each month across the one, twos and others. But again, really, really nice, just exploratory data analysis to just do a really, really quick and dirty count of different things, uh, which again, really, really helpful, quick and easy uh, type stuff. You, you can put more than two things in there, but then it starts getting quite complicated in how it's displayed. So, um, and our data set probably isn't set up to do that, but uh, you can do. Um, and yeah, that's quite interesting as, as well. So that was some um, pretty, pretty useful base R type stuff. And like I say, it's really, really useful when you just got sort of like quick and dirty. I tend to find that I'm writing those within the console. Um, so I've got a data set. I don't want to keep this. It's just that I want to do a quick eyeball check on my data. Um, and those kind of functions are just really, really useful for, for that sort of eyeball check, just to make sure I've got everything in, in right and yeah, all of those sort of things. So we are now going to go into a, a bit more deployery type stuff. Um, where are we for time? Yeah, we're all good. So uh, renaming columns. So quite often uh, we need to rename columns. Um, quite often, especially if you are importing data from Excel, then uh, we get data sets that have spaces in them in the name of their columns, which is really naughty, but Excel loves doing that stuff. So um, that's really good. So it's just like, how do we deal with spaces in our data set? And potentially, uh, although I probably will come on to um, data tables and, and creating output tables in, a, in another session at one point, sometimes you want to rename your, your data set to actually have a space in it to, to fit in a table. However, I would say that you want to keep your data set pure and rename it within the table. But courses for courses. So let's just rename and put a space within our our, uh, our variable name. So at the moment, we've got a nice tidy org code, but we want to change it to organization space code. So in order to do that, we need to put our, our uh, new variable name in backticks. So backticks, I also sound like bat ticks, um, which I always get really confused with. That's some sort of ticks for bats. And I'm, I'm picturing some sort of scratchy bat, but that's just me. Uh, but anyway, we use a rename function and we use the bat tick function. The back tick is the little tick on the top left of your keyboard above your tab and to the left of your number one. Um, which I guess if you've done markdown, you've you found yourself and, and there it is. Um, but yeah, back tick. So that is kind of the equivalent of a square bracket in SQL, um, I guess, is yeah the equivalent. So yeah, if you've done SQL and you want to create variable names with, with spaces in, and then uh, use back ticks. Uh, Simon says, don't use variable names with space names, uh, with spaces in them. But, you know, sometimes you do. So right, let's just run that through and we'll go back to our data. And now we can see up here, we've got our organization name. I can also do my call names data here. And we can also see here, we have our lovely organization code now as a, with a space. So anytime now I want to do, if I want to do data and I do my dollar sign, organization code, you can see that R pops in these back ticks. So anytime I want to call it now, I've got to put back ticks around it which makes it really awkward and frustrating and very hard for my poorly little eyes to see. So let's not do that. So let's also rename some of our variables to something horrible. Um, so yeah, if we run that through, that will give that one a space. We want to change our breaches with, to, to a capital B. We want to we want to change our period to period all in, in capital letters. And we're going to commit a cardinal crime here. We're going to call our type type, but we're going to put a blank space at the start of it 
So if Simon catches you do that, you are very much on the naughty step. So let's not do that. But unfortunately, that's just the kind of stuff I see all the time. So let's have a look at our coal names data now. It what a hideous mess. Um, so yeah, not good, not good at all. So, uh, yeah, now if we look at it, like I said that's a typical NHS England data set now we have with lots of really, really horrible names. So, that is my second favorite after the tidyverse, um, uh, package, which I think generally of any code I write starting from scratch will be library tidyverse library janitor because uh, it's just awesome for for cleaning stuff up so uh we should have installed that right at the start and that should work so if we call that library now um it does have a very very strange thing that it does mask chi square tests and fisher tests um which is really frustrating especially because i did a really big of analysis which used a load of fisher tests and um i didn't realize it masked it so there we go so Janitor comes with this beautiful function called clean names, which pretty much does what it says on the tin. So we've got a data set which is is messy uh, and it's got a load of different, as we can see, all our column names are all, all completely inconsistent. However, if we run the lovely data is clean names data, we will run for it. And now if we look at our coal names, data it has cleaned them all so shifts them all down to lowercase it removes any blank spaces at the start it will put underscores instead of spaces between uh, any spaces if you've got something uh, a column name that starts with a numeric it will put uh, uh, it will impute an x in front of it so that you're not starting with a, a numerically named variable does all those really, really good things for you in one fell sweep with, with the clean names function. So I love that so much. And without a doubt, again, if you look at most of the analysis that I run, it will be import data in whatever pre method that is. And then second thing would be clean names. Um, so that makes it all, all nicely better. So we've got a quick one for you. Um, so we want to change uh, our breaches to number of breaches with spaces in. So run that and just check that it's changed. We then want to change it back again. And we also want to change organization code back to org code. Um, so the rename function is really, really useful, but I always get it backwards around which order the rename goes because that's just me. So that was my little hint. That's more to me than to you. So, uh, like I say, it might be worth just checking your coal names before you start so you know what you've got. Uh, yeah. And again, I also find it's really helpful that I can just double click and copy those and, and paste them into places. Because... I can't spell, um, so yeah. Looks like we got some stuff in. We answered that in the chat. Yep, all good. Okay. As I say, I think we've got Zoe on board. So if there's anything that's massively uh, needs to be shouted out in the chat, do shout out. I can't see the chat, so don't assume that I'm reading it. In fact, I'm not reading it. So. Very, very basically, we can rename our number of breaches equals breaches. I always get it the wrong way around, and that's really on me. So we can just double check our coal names data. 
and then we've got our oh yeah sorry number of breaches so now i want to change it all back again so that one needs to go there and i also want to rename my uh organization code so it's org code equals organization code Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, I think I must have just had an internet blip. Okay. Yeah, I seem to have lost connection. Let me just... Hmm. Uh, Come in and go back in. Okay. What have I got in here then? I've got period or okay, yeah, I'm right. So just double check your call names for your data set that we've got period, org code, type, attendances, breaches, and admissions. And we haven't got anything else. Okay. So uh janitor, really, really lovely uh package. It's got some other really great functions in it, which I'm not gonna go through now, but do check it out. If you've got things, if you've imported an Excel sheet and it's brought through the dates as Excel numbers, it's got a lovely little function that just basically converts Excel numbers back into dates. Uh, it's got a great thing that uh, allows you to find duplicates in your data sets and, and just basically find duplicates and it will just pull through the, the duplicated rows. And you can also find duplicated rows based on different columns. So have I got duplicates on... Uh, provider and this and this, and it will pull through all the sort of duplicates based on various different functions, which is really, really good. Uh, also does some really nice sort of subtotal stuff for you as well, if you just want a really quick quick count of how many th um, totals of, of stuff as well. So um, really, really good. Uh, really, really good stuff. Okay, so let's move on to the select statement so uh, i think we've covered a, a bit of select within the original um uh training but select is really 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 powerful and what's really you probably don't understand or don't know about it is that you can use select in some other functions which allow it to be even more powerful which is it which is really really cool so um so say we want to do um a data select and we just want to select period and org code so hopefully you would recognize that now we've just got a data set now that instead of six variables it's just got our two variables which are period and org code so hopefully nothing too mind-blowing there uh we can uh what have we got here Oh, I've done differently there. I can't work that now. Uh, I don't understand what I've said there. Okay. Oh, I see what that difference is. So, yeah, when we look at our data select, we have got period followed by org code. We can also select org code, then period. And if we run it that way around, when we look at our uh, selection we've now got org code then period so the order that you select things in a select statement is the order that it comes out in your new data frame uh which again if you want to just sort of reorganize your data set is is really really good um so um i think that's me going through some bits so you can also do a, a simple rename at the select stage, uh, which is quite interesting. So a bit like you would with a SQL select statement where you could add an alias, 
you can also do that at this stage as well. So where we had a period, we could change that to date dot period. And where we had org code, we could change that to organization. So if we look at that one, we've now got date underscore period and we've got organization instead of org code. So again, that's a bit like adding an alias into a, a select statement, a, a SQL statement. So probably not the best way of doing things, but um, yeah, it's just a, a, a way of saving code rather than having to sort of add in an additional rename function at another point. Um, you can also put a, uh, a put your uh, features within a, uh, a mini vector and put a exclamation mark at the start of it to say not this and a negative effect. So we want to select knock, not org code and not period. So if we look at that one, hopefully we've selected everything else apart from those two. So again, depending on how big your data frame is, and if you just want to remove one or two things, instead of selecting everything except that, you can start select everything except those things. Um, but you have to put your multiples within a vector. So if you try to do a select not org or not period, uh, that won't work because if we look at it now, it doesn't actually work properly. It still pulled them through. So that doesn't work. Doesn't work. The worst thing of that is, is that it doesn't fail. Um, I'd rather it failed and come up with an error, uh, but it doesn't. It just simply doesn't work. If you do want to do it that way, you can do, again, you can do a negative in front of it, and that does work. So if we do a, a select minus org code and minus period, uh, again, when we look at that, they're magically gone. So that's relatively straightforward select statement. What's really nice is select allows us, it's got some additional verbs that we can put into our, uh, our select statement. So we can use the contains. So basically we want to contact, we want to select any, any column name that contains ES. And that's anywhere within the string itself. So if we run that one and we look at our data select, it's brought through our attendances and our breaches at the end there. Um, and that's really good, especially when we start doing sort of multiple calculations and things. And if you have all your totals and you've sort of renamed them in a certain way, so we've got like total pathway one, total pathway two, total pathway three, and you've organized your data in a really nice way, then you can use that select statement to be, you know, really, really nice across your data set and save you loads of time. Uh, we can also do a not contains, uh, which basically does uh, as expected. Uh, so if we do a not contains, that will basically do the inverse. So we can say we don't want any any columns which contain that do contain this. So again, uh, that's the sort of doing the inverse. We can also um, go a little bit more meta into our data set. So we can say we want to select the data where the data is numeric. So we don't. We just want to select all our numeric columns. So let's have a look at what that looks like. And we go in there, and as if by magic, it just brings through those attendances, breaches, and omissions. Um, as I said, this stuff gets really, really cool uh, and really, really powerful, especially when we sort of add those sort of select statements into other other functions, which we will do later. Um, there is also a really, really nice everything function, uh, which basically selects everything. But you can say, I want to select admissions first, then breaches. And then just everything else, because I can't be bothered to write everything else out in full. So uh, it will run those through. And so hopefully we will have uh, emissions and breaches and then everything else. So we've got emissions, breaches, and then everything else without duplicating uh, anything that we've already selected. So it's, it's not going to duplicate those across, which is really, really nice. So uh, we've got an over to you. So... Select the data so that it is in the order of admissions, any column that is a factor, and then anything else. My goodness me, who wrote this rubbish? So let me just have a look at the answer and just make sure I 
and phrase that question in a reasonable way. So we want to, uh, yeah, so the data in the order, I'm not talking about the data, the actual data in order. So we want basically a data table that's going to be emissions first, then any column that is a factor, and then anything that's left over next. So that's the order we want our column. So we want, I would like, uh, yeah, the admissions first, that would be our first column, second column, and any other columns, any columns that are a factor, and then whatever's left, chuck on the end. And I will, uh, look at that, there we go. Ba -ba 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 -ba. What's the easiest? Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I do. Okay, okay. So let's have a look at this. I'm going to cheat and nick some of the stuff I had already. So we definitely want admissions first. So that should be a no-brainer. So we've got our data select. We want admissions first. Then we want any column that is a factor. So we had something up here somewhere where we had where is numeric. We don't want is numeric. We want is factor. So let's just change that. And then we want anything else. Well, that's just everything then. So if we run that one, we look at our data set. We've got our admissions. Looking at our data sets, we can see that our org code and our types are factors. So that's pulled those through. And then it's pulled through everything else. So I think potentially we could do is date. Oh, capital D for is date because and that should bring us admissions period and everything else. There we go, admissions period, then everything else. So again, if you want to identify where all your dates are, or you just want to pull through the date columns of a, 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 a giant big data set, but you only want to pull through where you've got dates and, and sort of cut things down, again, really, really useful stuff to be able to chuck about with. Um, a bit like if you use the as.date, I don't know why the, that is capitalized. It's just a horrible, horrible base R thing that, makes no sense but we will have a chat with that nice mr wickham and uh see what the heck's going on so where are we uh okay we'll just do a quick bit of alternative joining and then we will have a coffee break so any questions on those selecty things before we move on everybody happy with that Do shout, scream. Anybody got horribly stuck with that? We will take silence as compliance. Okay. So some alternative joins. So uh, within uh, the the introduction course, we did a lot of like left joins, which is your bread and butter uh which is really really useful i mean your left join and uh your inner join i mean i guess i definitely think there's like a sliding scale i think i think like left join does at least 95 percent of stuff nobody uses it, hardly anything else and then there's about I think there's about three percent use case for like an inner join and i've probably got about a one percent case where i use a cross join and there's other types of joins meh i'm sure some people use them occasionally somewhere so sometimes, you know, that's very much looking at joins within keys and that's very much your traditional sort of SQL type join or your V lookup. Just wanted to show that there are some other types of joins which probably weren't covered in the uh, the initial training, uh, which is basically just concatenation. So you're not necessarily joining on a feature. You are literally 
smushing two data sets together. Um, so let's just build ourselves two data sets. So we've got data frame one and data frame two. So data frame one has got, where are we? Data frame one has got the period, org code type and attendances. And we've just brought back the top five just to make it easier to see. And then we've got data frame two, which has got the attendances, breaches and admissions in it. So we've got two, two uh two data sets um each of them with six rows and we want to jam them together side by side so basically we want to create ourselves a new data set a new data frame out of those two data frames which will still be six observations but so no let me get this right yeah six observations and seven variables so basically we want to smush them together side by side so we can do something called column bind which means we're sort of binding by columns uh so if we do our df new and we do our columns and we look at our df new we now have sort of joined them together side by side also really interesting to see because we had a duplicated column uh, in both data sets, it's pulled them both through and it's uh, just renamed one of them. So we've got a, a, a dot one because uh, it doesn't like having the, the same name. So R is then that automatically for us. So just something to be aware of. And like I say, it's just mushed them together side by side. So if you were trying to make some sort of inference from it, you've got to really make sure that your data is in the right order. Because um, all it is blindly is doing is pushing them together side by side. It's not joining them on any sort of specific key or any specific order or anything. It is just jamming them together. Um, so just to say that is a, a thing you can do, but you know it's just something to be really, really aware of. We can also uh, sort of jam our data together by uh, by rows. So if we look at make two more data frames so we're going to have data frame one which is our sort of top five across each of those and then we've got a new data frame two which is our bottom five and it's all the same number of uh, uh, observations and then we can bind it by rows and look at our new one and basically this is joined one data set and it's just mushed it onto the bottom of the other one uh this is far far more useful than column pined because at least you can be you know we're probably looking at a you know each observation or each thing that we're a feature is going to be a row so um row bind is far far more useful column bind is a little bit dangerous but you know just what we'd cover it so row bind is really really useful especially if you've got two data frames which you've calculated sort of together and sort of smush them together. Um, so if we don't have, so bind rows is really, really good and it's sort of a base R thing, but it only match, only works where we have matching columns. Um, so we have to have the same matching columns in order to sort of join them. If the columns don't match, uh, bind rows will fall over. However, there is uh, an alternative. I don't know, what am I talking about? No, no, bind rows does work. Yeah, yeah. So let's have a look at what happens if we have got different columns in our, on our rows. So let's create uh, a new set uh, of... Simon, sorry, I don't think you can see hands up either, can you, if you can't see the chat, but there's a hand up. I have to shout. Uh, Felix? Yeah, uh, two questions. So... Uh... The first one is this bind row. So you said the the columns have to be same. Do they have to be the same order of columns? So if it's same column headings, but not in uh, the same order, will it work? I think no, no, they don't. I'm in fact, I was wrong about bind rows. Bind rows works, bind columns doesn't work if you haven't got the same number of variables. So this example I am back to show you is going to be different levels of, of uh columns so if we run these ones we've got one uh data frame which has got period all code and attendances and our other one has the full set and we're going to put one on top of the other so if we do that and bind the rows 
we get a new column and basically where they don't match it will put uh, NAs in there so basically because we didn't have those columns in our original top data set it's put sort of nulls in there so let's just try your example out is the best way we can uh, do things so your example was what happens if they're in a different order? So let's do exactly that. Uh, so let's do tail and we will have all code first. We'll have period, sentences there, and then type. So, and let's also have, um, come up with the breaches. Let's just make it really complicated. So data frame one has period or code type attendances. Data frame two has all code period attendances type. Obviously those are in a different order and also breaches. And then let's see what happens if we try to bind them. So it hasn't failed and we've looked at it now and it has managed to work out which which order they're in it's taken default from the first item so it's put them through so they don't have to be in the in the right order and likewise where we've got something in one and not the other where it's it's pulled that through and obviously put nulls in where we don't have them so hopefully that answers simon there is a question in the chat as well which may relate to that as well from what you've just shown but what about duplicates if you use bind rows so if you're binding it say on the same table twice what what happens let's find out oh and felix you still got your hand up oh oh i'll put it down that okay, that, that was very right, helpful <laughs> literally do that let's let's go crazy and bind uh an additional thing in there twice and it's going to duplicate it so yeah, if you do bind something in again, it is just going to create a new row and it will duplicate our, our data. So if we look at our attendances here. So yeah, we can clearly see it has uh, duplicated our, our data where, we, where we've got to, which <laughs> may or may not be a good thing. And, uh, you know, hopefully then you can go back to your janitor package and identify where you've got your duplicates. Uh, which would be really cool. So I uh, got a quick over to you. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Create a data frame of the top five admissions only and the bottom five attendances only and join the two columns together. Okay. Yeah, that seems... So, yeah. So... I guess this is building on some of the stuff we did like 10 minutes ago as well. So do feel free to to jump back. Um, I'm not sure. And I think that's something for this course, just be aware of. We might be doing something on one function, but we will pull on something that we've done previously. So I think that's the really exciting bit of R is sort of seeing how functions can interact with each other so you can learn one function that does one thing but actually you know, i can get that function then to interact with this function and come up with something even more exciting so uh yeah so that's really uh, a good good message so so we just want attendances and so we want a, a data frame which only has the top five emissions so i just want a data frame which has just got single column of admissions and the top five and then i want another data frame that has got a single column of the bottom five attendances and that's all it has and then we want to bind those columns together So, Ooh, let me... Bit of data one. 
No, no, DF1, I was calling it that. DF1. Okay, okay. So here's my solution. So start off with our DF1. We just want to select admissions. We want to do our top five based on admissions. So if we look at our DF1, we should have just add admissions uh, column. Likewise for our DF2, we're going to run that through. And that seems the want to hang forever because it seems to be really complicated. I lost it again. Oh, no, there we go. The F2. And then we've just got our attendances. And then we can bind those two together. And we've got our DF new, which is our attendances uh, next to our admissions. Uh, just to say there is an alternative way that you can use buying columns. So you can chuck it into a pipe. So we can do our DF uh, new, our, uh, our DF1, and then bind coals DF2. Personally, uh, I think this is one of, the, one of the places where I find a pipe harder to read around what it's doing. I quite like the bind coals to be quite implicit around what you're doing or your bind rows uh, around what you're doing. But mileage may vary. People might prefer it that way. I, I just think it's one place where I think the pipe is possibly the harder to read um, uh, stuff. This is quite clear that I am binding the columns of this and this, whereas this, I don't know. To me, my little foil boys, I find that harder. But anyway... So, uh, last little bit on, on joining. So, uh, likewise, uh, there are ways of joining columns when you don't have columns of the same sizes and things like that, and that gets a little bit messy. Without a doubt, the join family of functions is far better for, for that kind of thing. I think what is useful is the R bind, column bind is, is very challenging. And because it doesn't keep, you know, it's very specific about the order that it puts things in. Uh, you've got to be very, very, very wary about how you use it. Um, but row bind is really, really useful because obviously you can do some calculations and they just sort of chuck on the end of your, your data frame and that's not so bad. Um, we've already done some duplicates, I think. So let's just have a look at this one. Going to rename my breach, uh, my admissions to be breaches, just to be, uh, just to be annoying. So if I look at my data set now, I've got uh, RF code and admissions, uh, and I'm going to call this one uh, admissions as well. So I've got DF1 with admissions and DF2 with admissions, but with different values for RF4. So basically, I wanted to make sure that I have an RF4 across my data set and I've got admissions and I've got a different number for admissions, but with the same uh, data set. And then we can do a union, which basically works very similar to uh, 
um, uh, and a, a, a sequel union, and it will basically smush them all together and create a a it will duplicate the values, but within one admissions table. So now. I should have put the date in as well because that would have made more sense. But now for each of the uh, RF, for each row, I've now got two or more admissions uh, dates, uh, sorry, admission numbers for, for each one. Does that make sense? Or I kind of think I've gibbered a bit there. So yeah, the union, um, basically where I did have two rows, uh, two columns, both called admissions, but with different values. So I had RF1 with those admissions and I had my, so my RF4, I did have, let's just, uh, that's not helpful, is it? Uh, uh, no, that's really not useful. Let's go back to here. Uh, let's run that one again. Sorry. So we'll cut this out in post production. It'd be really slick in the in the in the DVD version anyway. Uh, so so my RF four here, where I've got three admissions, and then I've got my my different data set here, and I've got my RF four, and I've got three admissions in my union data set. It, though it doesn't show here because it's not in the right order. What I will have is my RF four, and there will be six admissions. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. It doesn't make sense here because obviously I haven't filled it. The other three are down here somewhere and I have no idea where they are. So I need to make that a little bit clearer. Uh, Simon, what, sorry. Yes. You might be about to say this though. Uh, does union work the same way as bind rows? Um, kind of. Yeah, there are some nuances to it and it doesn't work exactly the same um, in that it does... So if well, I'm just trying to work out, so yeah, where you've got nulls, bind rows will return the nulls. I think a union will like, skip them. Um, so I just need to remember off the top of my head. I think that's what it says. I'll have a look in the break and just see 100% what the difference is. I think that is the difference. Um, I would stick with bind rows. Union's horrible. It's horrible in SQL. It's it's horrible in R. Um, what is quite useful is finding identical columns in both tables. So, as I said, there is there are ways within a uh, janitor package which does this much much nicer. Um, but this does work quite nicely. So, finding identical columns in both tables. So, the DF inter so the intersect will basically tell you where we've got a column in one table and a column in the a new different table. So if we look at the DF intersect, it will basically tell us where we've got the same thing in both tables. So we have a lot of organization codes with an emissions of zero. Um, so we have a, a, a row with Y, whatever it is, uh, admissions in data column, data frame one, and it's in data frame two. So again, really, really good. Uh, if you've got two different data sets and you want to know if you've got um, duplicates within two different data sets rather than having to join them together. Likewise, you can do the inverse. So you can say, I've got one data frame over here and I've got one data frame over here and they should be the same. Can I find any rows where they're different? Um, so that's basically set difference and that will tell us where we've got data frames uh, which are different uh which will be uh where's that gone up here somewhere so this will basically give us unique values that exist in a, either of the two data frames so uh, again really really useful um but both of those are sort of base re things and like i said really really quick and dirty ways of uh having a look at differences so um Okay, that's probably a look at that spot on time exactly at eleven o'clock as I as I absolutely aimed for and expertly planned for. Um, so yeah, let's take a, a quick ten minute uh, breather for some coffee and comfort, etc. If there's any sort of questions, whatever, do chuck them in the chat, and I'll have a quick look at them when I've had some coffee, and um, then we will reconvene at. Uh, 10 past 11 sharpish unless there's any quick questions now on any of that 
know it's quiet in the chat. I can pause recording as well for the 10 minutes. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hopefully, uh, most people have returned. Um, so that's recording on. Okay, so I, hope, I don't know. Yeah, okay. Thank you uh, for those who have returned. Uh, if anybody's not here, do shout. Uh, that doesn't work, does it? So don't shout if you're not here. Um, or do shout if you're not here because you've had enough of me already. But anyway, we've got more of me, uh, aren't you lucky? Right. So <laughs> without purpling on, we're going to do some more group buys, but with uh, some sort of mutate and summarize. So depending on when you were taught R and how you use R, uh, depends where you, you might have used your uh, buy statement and group buy. So old school way would be get my data, uh, do my data, do a group by, group by type, summarize my count, and then ungroup it, uh, which is very much the old school way of doing it. The, 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 the kids are no longer doing like that. So the new school way of doing it is there is a dot by feature within summarize and filter and uh, deploy verbs now, which allows you to do your group by within your summarize or your mutate statement. Um, and that is really, really, really super powerful. And also means your code is, well, obviously much shorter. That gets converted into this. So all the examples sort of going forward, I am going to be using the, the new school version. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there is anybody who is, uh, obviously, obviously it totally depends on how long you've been using R. Uh, this is relatively new and exciting to me. I've only been, I only found out about this a couple of months ago and I was like, wow, this is amazing. So uh, yeah. So we will be doing our group buys within our summarizes and our mutating statements. What's also really, really nice about this is if you have done any sort of group buys before and you get this lovely warning message flash up that dot groups has, I can't remember what the message is now, I've seen it a million times, but anyway, you know that message that comes up when you do a group buy and it says such and such and such and such and such a warning and it help, tries to warn you that your data set is still grouped, especially if you've forgotten to do an ungroup. By default, after, your, uh, after you've done your dot buy, any groupings is, are, are removed from your data frame, which is really, really, really helpful and really good practice. So um, not going to go into massive amounts of detail, but basically if you do an old school group by and you group your data, it adds a feature to your to your data frame. And even if you then go and take your data frame and feed it to something else, it will still be grouped um, within the, that data frame. So if you forget to ungroup it, there are times when you do things and it will still do a calculation based on your grouping rather than, you know, after you finish doing whatever you've done by a group, you might not want to do it, but, you know, you might work the entire total, grand total, rather than the group total. So um, so that's why it's always good practice to ungroup your, your, your group by statements. But as I said, new school does it uh, by default, which is awesome. So uh, we'll just double check that. That should be new. That's wrong, isn't it? Look at that. So old school data, if we did uh, uh, data old, let's just get rid of some of these. So uh, my data old is basically doing a group by and it's just counting how many type ones type twos and type threes i've got and then the new school would be exactly the same and then i look at my data new and it's done exactly the same oh, i just shut up there. there we go so uh does exactly the same and also if you think about it that is very much similar to the table function that we used earlier so that's kind of a, a tight way to do a, a table function uh likewise we can use this dot by within our um uh mutate statement so again old school way would be doing it is we were doing a data old uh data and then we do a type we do our new emissions so i'm just creating a new data column called double emissions which is emissions times two and look at that one and i've got my data old so blah, 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 blah. And here I've got new, my new column and it's grouped by uh, each of these and it's done my uh, 
admissions times two, whereas the new school way would be is to do it by the type and group it by um, uh, group it by the the type just within the mutate statement. So if I do that one to be new. And that will do it exactly the same. It's just it's it's uh, calculated it across. So that's the difference between the the group by and just putting the dot by within the mutate statement. And going forward, as I said, I will be using the uh, the new version. So just to say, uh, let's do some sort of simple stuff going forward. So count functions. Uh, up here, I did a summarize count uh, equals n, and that's just the uh, n, and that does a count. I can achieve exactly the same, uh, or more or less the same, with a count function, uh, which will allow me to do data count. And I can look at my count, and I can see I've got type one, type two, and three, and other. And then I've got literally here. I've got a new column, uh, which is my data account. So instead of having to do that whole group by and, and count, there is basically a, a function that does exactly that. So that would be exactly the same as, as doing that. Uh, but obviously that's far quicker. So let's do the quick version. Um, we can also do a, a count within feature. So if I wanted to do a count of organization codes, I can do an add count and run that one, and that will then give me, um, instead of doing a summary uh, and a summarize um, by uh, each of the, sorry, so instead of doing a summarize by type, which is basically what a count is, an add count is equivalent to a mutating count. So it's gonna give me a count of the total number of org codes on a, on a, on a new column. So if I look at this one, I can see that RF4 has submitted 108 uh, things. Uh, ADE 913 has submitted 36, et cetera. So if I organize, if I do this by, by N, I can see that all code one has submitted one. All code one is one. This all code has got three, so it's brought through three. This one's got four, four, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of doing a summarize, it's basically added it as a new column. So uh, it's basically a, a mutate. So uh, that's what that one does. So um, fancy filtering. Uh, so filters very much within, um, I guess, sort of the basic training as we do, we would do a filter such and such equals something um what's really nice is that we can start adding some more fancier um things into our filter so let's here look at our data and we want to filter it with any organization code that has uh, the capital letter r in it so we're using a string detect function and we're going to run our string detect on all code and we will bring out any any org code that's got an R in it. So if we look at our data filter, we've got our org codes and they have all got an R in them. And at any point as well, I don't know if there's any versions later on the bottom, I'm not sure there is actually, no. Um, but it would find them at any point. So I guess that's kind of the or equivalent of a in in SQL. Um, at the moment, obviously, that is very much looking at an R, uh, just anywhere within the um, uh, within the string. There are ways, if you uh, know anything about regex, where you can really, really specify specific string types. So you could say, is there something that's got an R as the second character and then is followed by the seventh character needs to be a four. So there are ways of setting up those kind of detect string type things, if you so wish. Not going to go into that now because that gets very, very much more complicated. But do a Google for regex or advanced uh, string detection, and it will tell you sort of things like that. Uh, what we can also do is add in filters with um, 
um, what's the word I'm looking for, with, with other functions in that. So for this one, I'm going to filter my data. I want to filter where my period is the maximum period. So basically, I want to bring back the latest, just the latest date for each um, organization code. So I want to, I want to my period to be the maximum period, but then I'm grouping it by organization code. So this is where we start getting into really quite cleverer stuff. So we've got our data frame, which has got all the different, um, you know, bits, but we just want to bring back the latest by organization code. So if we run that one through, we now have um, basically this date here will be the last time or the latest date of submission for for this uh, for this uh, type. So this is looking at organization code and obviously type as well. So we may have duplicates across um, organization codes because we've got different types. Um, but it will be the last time that they uh, submitted for each of these data types, which I think would be the same anyway, because if they submit once, it would, it would cancel it. Um, if we want to be more clever, we could say, you know, what was the latest time they submitted a data above zero for each of these uh, things uh, and could add that in there as well. Um, so again, just by adding that dot by within a filter allows us to do sort of, sort of some clever bits, which again, if you're looking across different regions or different teams or different ICBs or wherever it is or providers that you're looking at, you know, if you want to bring back the latest data point for each thing or, or you've got a list of kpis you know know what the latest data is that's that's really cool um we can also do things like add in ands into our data filters so we don't just have to do one thing uh, we can do multiple well, um, right. data filter. you should filter by org code so maximum period just for this column or code. So for example, if you're looking for two different things, how you how you're going to distinguish when you have dot dot by equal to something or code. So, so what what happens is the group by is happening by or code. Is that correct? Or it's yeah. working on everything? No, it's just grouping by the org code. So it is bringing okay the latest date by the organization code. So perhaps, you know, this isn't a good example because we haven't got good data for it. So say there was, because at the moment we've got one org code here and we've got one, two and three, but it's all the same date. But let's just pretend that these had different dates. So we wanted to, we wanted to group it by the organization code and the latest date by type as well. So you can add in a, um, a, a vector into our organization code and have type in there as well. So much like you can in uh, uh, the old style group by, you can have more than one thing within your by statement as well. So you don't have by just one thing, you can group by multiple things. Um, that wouldn't be a good example because it wouldn't it would come on with exactly the same data but yeah you can group by multiple things okay uh, which again is really really powerful that you you know if you wanted to know for each organization what was the last time they submitted for group type one what was the last time they submitted for group two and other or whatever or the last time they submitted for this kpi this kpi this kpi across your entire data set so Again, really, really lovely, lovely, uh, lovely function. So we can do that. Um, we can do an and, uh, and the simplest way to do that is just add in an extra, uh, an extra comma, an extra feature. So in this instance, we're going to filter where our type equals one, and our attendances are over ten thousand. So we can look at our data, and then we've only got ten. Uh, so we've only got our ones and our attendances. If we put them in order we can see that that starts at 10,000. So that's nice and easy. We can also, oops, we can also do an or. Um, so ors are designated within uh, within R with this line, which is, if you go to your keyboard, again, 
I love how R goes to the extremities. So this is bottom left um, next to your shift key. Uh, so it's shift key, uh, was it backslash, forward slash, I don't know which one that is, um, will give you a a line, I guess. I don't know what, I don't know if it's got a fancy, a fancy programming name. It probably has actually. I really want to Google that or know what that's called. Uh, but basically that defines an or. So in this instance, we are going to filter anything where we've got type one or any attendances over 10,000. So as long as it matches one of those criteria, it will come through. So let's have a look. So we've got some others here, but we can see that the attendances are over 10,000. So it met that criteria. And we've got attendance here that is less than 10,000, but we can see that it's a type one. So obviously it met that criteria. Um, so that's that's um, an or statement. And or statements are really powerful. However, they can get you into big trouble, especially, especially I, I, I don't know, in SQL, they're an absolute nightmare compared with, with making sure you've got all your brackets in absolutely the right place. I would recommend if you can formulate your question not to include an or, that would be a really, really good way of doing things. Um, void ors by ors all, <laughs> all means possible. So, oh, here we go. Over to you. Can you write a script to check if we have more than one row per organization code? And if we have not, return only those where we have more than one row. And for bonus points, put them in the order by number of rows. So we want to know how many, uh, where are we? So let's just double check what the answer is. What I was, let's see if I can reformulate my question to make some sense. So we want to do a count of some description on our organization code. So we want to know have we got uh, one at least one row per organization code? Uh, write a script to see if we've got one row per organization code. Order it and then put them in the order of rows. See what I've done as an answer. I'm still not sure that question's quite right. Yeah, I think that's okay. I think that is sort of right. So we want to do a count of the organization name codes, count of organization codes, order them, and make sure that we have got at least one um, per organization. And then hopefully bring up something that just pulls that through as quickly as possible. Um, what might be useful, um, so we do want to do a summary. Um, so we want to summarize. So have a look at how we can do a count of summarize. Might also be useful for the bonus points to have a look at some of the extra extra features that you can add into the uh, count, if that's what we're using, into the function that you'll be using and see if it's got any extra features that might be useful to help answer this question in a quick and easy way. Sorry, I think I need to go back and read aloud some of my questions sometimes and uh, make sure they make sense. This one definitely doesn't so much. Ah, uh, uh, okay. I think my question was based on this data filter, our last one that we did. So my apologies, that should be made clear. So use this data filter to answer this question, I think was what I was after. 
that makes more sense. So I'll whiz through this one because the question's a bit rubbish. So what I want to do is data filter, and then I want to count on the org code. Looking at my count function, one of the questions here is, can I put them in order? So if I did my absolutely straight count org code, and we look at my data filter, it comes through, but they're not in any particular order. I could add in a classic, oops, I can't spell my pipe, a range. I could organize it by, uh, by N, because I think that's what it calls it. And I could do it that way, and then it's arranged by N. But if I wanted to do it uh, by order of number of rows, I might have to do that descending and all of that. So that's not good. The clue was to look at the count function. So if I do a, a question mark count, uh, so normally it just takes in an X and it's got these extra bits and pieces. So we do have an option here for sort. So if I do sort equals true when I run that, and I look at my date filter now. Now it's run through and it's sort them for me automatically without having to chuck through uh, an additional, uh, uh, what am I looking for, an, an additional arrange. I can do it within my, my account function, which is quite nice. And then I can just do a very quick double check. My N is greater than one and run that one i don't think that makes any difference i'm not sure whether greater than one i think that should have been greater than 10 or something uh i'll add it in for a later version so now we've got our bits and then it's got anywhere there's uh greater than yeah one row check with uh, if not oh if not return only where we have more than one row so that does kind of make sense so i can do filter n is greater than one and that gives me that. So that big horrible question was basically to get you to have a look at doing this query on the count function and hopefully find the sort function. Did anybody find that? So yeah, where this hint was to look at what else the function can do, it was basically look up the count function and hopefully you'll find this sort. Okie dokie. Uh, where are we at? We're doing good. Um, as I said, do shout if there's any issues. Um, and it is a case of shouting, not putting hands up because I can't see the, the hands or anybody or anything. So conditionals. Uh, conditionals, really, really useful. Um, very much a big bit of, I guess, things things like in Excel, and you can also do those within uh, SQL. So basically, we want to do uh, something where if it's this, do that. Otherwise, do that. Um, really, really useful for a number of different reasons and a number of different ways. The most basic ways we can do things is by an if-else statement. Um, and so for this instance, we're going to look at our data and we're going to mutate a new column, which is going to be a co called above 20,000. And it will be if else, if attendances are above 20,000, then we're going to populate that with a Y. If it doesn't meet that criteria, we're going to do an N. So basically, that will give us a very, very basic. Oh, I've got to let Zoe in. Should we let Zoe in? Yeah, let's let Zoe in. Um, 
So we're going to do a really, really basic sort of flag on our data set just to uh, bring those through. So let's just run that on our data. And we can see now we've got a new flag here. So where our attendances are above 20,000, we've got a Y. Otherwise, we've got an M, um, which, again, is really, really nice, especially uh, with us, with our lovely KPIs. Have they met the KPI? Yes, no, because we're all about really boring binary stuff. So uh, anyway, so that's that's really good. Um, really, really good note to, uh, to, to self is that the two output conditions need to be of the same data type. Otherwise, it will, uh, well, as I said here, it will throw a wobble. So if I try to make my data, if data above 20,000, and for whatever reason, if it's above 20,000, I want to give it the numeric 100. Uh, and if it's over, sorry, if it's not over 20,000, I want to give it the string 100. If I try to run that, uh, basically, error mutate cannot combine a double and false character, so it will not it will not like that. You need to have the same data type, so I can either change that to uh, three, ooh, yeah, three thousand two hundred, because that's what I happen to type, and then then we're happy again, and then we can look at our data, and there we go, we've got it in there. But as I said, needs to be of the same data type, otherwise it will not to be happy and we want a nice happy r so if else is really great for a single condition as in is it this yes or no and if you really really want to you can nest if if else statements so you can say if it's this then this else if it's this then this else if it's this then this but that gets really really messy really quickly and it's really really horrible so uh what's much nicer and a cleaner way of doing things is using a case statement which allows us to create a a multi-part conditional um so let's say we want to make a new grouping column for our data set so we want to group our attendances by um various different things so we can say if our attendances are less than five thousand we're going to call it less than five thousand if it's less than ten thousand we're going to give it this grouping etc etc the case statement will work through in the order of the if the variables that you've put them in so if i put this yeah, well, that's really messy. I'll tidy it up in a minute. So if I put that first, if that is the, because obviously if I had 500 attendances, which I was hoping was going to go into this column, if I have 500 attendances, because it met this criteria first, it would pick that as the criteria and it would not use any of these other criteria until we got over twenty five thousand. so you gotta be really really careful about how you uh, structure your case statements it will pick the first thing which is really quite useful um but just something you really really need to be aware of so this basically says our data is our data mutate um our attendance grouping which is the name of our new variable and then we've got this case when so when attendances are less than five thousand then we've got this thing called the tilde again lovely bit of extremity of the keyboard if you look at your shift hash over on the right hand side next to your uh, return key we have the tilde symbol uh which does get used fair bit in R, especially if you start using per and some other sort of linear modeling type stuff and, and various bits and pieces. But for the purposes of uh, reading our case statement, it basically means then. So case when attendance is less than 5,000, then we're going to return less than 5,000. When it's this, we're going to use that. Then it's this, we're going to use this, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally, uh, we need a, a true statement, which is basically our else. So if it doesn't meet any of those other criteria, then our default is that it will be over 25,000. So let's just have a look at that and run that across our data. And we can see on our data now, we've got this lovely new uh, grouping column 
which looks at our attendances and spits them all into an appropriate sort of grouping, which is kind of good. So, as I said, uh, notice the true is our L statement and the tilde. Oh, my goodness, look. However, we've made a deliberate, deliberate mistake here in our, in our data. So, our function as it stands has got a little bit of a flaw, which let's just amend our data. Obviously, data ethics, we never amend our data, but we're going we're gonna to fudge our data. So... We're going to change our data uh, attendances at 0.1 and we're going to make it exactly 25,000. So let's just run that and then look at our data now. We have got attendances here now. So we've changed this now to be exactly 25,000. And now we're going to rerun our case statement here. So it's gone through this uh, statement and what have we got? It has put our 25,000 in the over 25,000 rate, basically because we've got a less than, less than, less than, less than, but no equals to, which is... Uh, very very poor practice so if we've got a, a result which happens to be exactly twenty five thousand, uh we haven't done twenty five thousand equals and plus so not not great likewise if we change our data attendances to be a null so if we had a null statement in our uh, data and we've run this Because we've done our group by and look at what condition it's met, when we've got a null in our attendances, again, it's grouped it into this 25,000 because it's gone, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this. Therefore, default, it's this. So, again, really, really not a good way of doing our, our case statement. So, what is the best, better way of doing our case statement? is to have your your else so try to encapsulate all your data within your attendances and then have your else as like an error message to just to point out that you you've got something that doesn't fit any of your criteria so now when we look at our data and we look at our data grouping we now have a new error does not compute Likewise, if we change it back to our 25,000 and we run our new data grouping over that, so just look at my data again. I've got my 25,000 running my uh, grouping over it again. Because our 25,000 does not match any of these criteria, we now have a 25,000 and an error does not compute, which again would be that sort of warning sign that I've created something where my, you know, my conditions hasn't been met. So uh, ideally what I would do is kind of convert that to a equals or plus two. Uh, so 25,000 and over would make more sense. So, very very easy mistake to make and it's just going to be that one edge case where you get that exact thing that doesn't fit within your attendances which is going to throw you so now when we run this oh what have i done doesn't matter that's interesting if i've done that the wrong way around ah sorry that was me now when we look at our data we've got our twenty-five thousand. now it's spitting it into our lovely Oh, I've done an extra zero, which is awesome. Uh, 25,000 and over. Let's just pop that properly in there. So hopefully now you've got a nice grouping that fits everything properly. Okay. Any questions on that? So that was basically creating a new grouping and our attendance grouping was our new variable. And basically, we just fed some text into it. We don't have to just feed text to it. We can um, feed in um, 
variables from from other columns to bring that through so that's what i would like you to try to have a go at so basically run through a new uh a new column which we will call whatever you want to call it and basically it will check if it's a type one it will half the uh or a result of half the number of attendances if it's a type two to triple the number of attendances and if it's type other to times the number of attendances by four and if it doesn't fit any of those then just return a suitable error or yeah check some does that make sense Also be mindful that this works very much similarly to the if else statement in that your error message or whatever you've put in there needs to match the same data type. So you almost want to create something uh, that you'd be able to pick up nice and easily. So let's have a look. And please shout if I'm going too fast. So run through my solution. So I'm creating a new column, which I'm just calling new attendance. And that's just going to be a case when. So when my type is one, and let's say this works sort of row wise. So when my type is one, I'm going to half my attendances. Where the type is two, I'm going to times it by three. Uh, is that right? Yeah, half triples. And then when my type is other, I'm going to times it by four. Otherwise, I'm going to bring back a result of 9,999,000 or whatever it is, which hopefully then would be sufficient for me to go, ah, I've got an error in my data. So now when I look at my data, I can see I've got uh, 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 an issue here. Oh, sorry, I've got a new column here, which depending on, so if it's a type one, I've halved it. If it's a type two, I've tripled it and if it's a type four i've quadrupled it yeah i don't know why you would want to do that exactly but hopefully you just get the idea that you can kind of create a new column based on something else and then give that an additional rule to say if it's do this then do this and if it's do this and this is do that uh which is which is quite nice Does that make sense? Any issues? And as I said, the, the, the case statement is hierarchical, so it will hit the first, first thing that it 
does. What we can do as well, and just to say, I mean, we could say that where breaches, uh, I can't remember where, over 500, then attendance is times four. So you're not, you're not stuck to like one column that you can do stuff. So you can make these lovely hierarchical things. So first of all, it will check if it's a type one. If it's a type one, it will do the uh, attendances times five. Let's just do that times 10 so we can see them nice easily. Then it will check the breaches column uh, and say, are the breaches over 500? If they are, do attendances by 10. Then it will go to the type column back again and say, if it's, is it a type two? In which case, I'll do attendances times three, et cetera. So we can run that and look at my crazy data set now. So I should have some... Uh, what am I looking for? Breaches above 500 that aren't type one. Um, I don't think I've got any, have I? No. <laughs> um, okay, that's not a good example, Simon. Let's do... Uh, uh, have I got any other breaches that are not type one at all? Okay, let's do this. See so if I can pick up this one then. So where it's a type, not a type one, but it's above uh, above 20, say. Maybe that will make more sense. So there we go. So I've got a here. So this one here. It's an other, but the breaches were above 20, so therefore it's given it a really big number. This one, where it was an other, but it was a type 2, sorry, it only had two breaches, so it's less than 20, hasn't made it, uh, hasn't times it by 10. So again, just to say that you can, long as you're just really, really mindful about the order that you put things in your case statements, you can do some really, really quite interesting things with those. Um, so that's sort of if else and uh and and case statements. So just gonna just gonna ping back to uh, base R again because who doesn't like uh, do who doesn't love a bit of base R? So base R works a little bit different around its if statements, but they're really cool. Um, so they don't work in a tidy way. So there is that. So let's just set up a variable to start with, which is a equals 10. So now we've got a variable, which a is 10. Awesome, so super duper good. And then we can run it through this if statement. So this is just basically how if statements work in base R. So we can say if, and then uh, brackets, so we do our brackets, so if a equals 10, and then we do curly brackets, and then basically, I will do everything that's in the curly brackets if A equals 10. So if we run that one through, and we run it through, and basically R's run through the code, but it hasn't actually done anything because A is not 5. So let's just make A equal, oops, A does equal 5, and then run it. It will now do all this. So basically now it is assigned A to be 10. It's printed that A is now 10. It has now created a new variable called B, which didn't exist before, uh, which is now 10 as well. And B has been created and is now A. So now we can look at our variable A and it is 10. And we can look at our variable B and it's 10. Before I ran this, when A did not equal 5, B didn't even exist. So actual base R stuff allows you to do some really quite powerful things. And um, yeah, is 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 quite good. This also, if we link right back to the top of our, our code, this is where this sort of came in. So this is where our if, uh, if we don't, so if we require our data sets, so require our data sets, we'll check whether we've got it installed. If it's not installed, then install our data sets. And then regardless of that, 
bit that that is statement run our uh, date uh, library call our library so should probably put a space in between those so again that's just an example of how we've um basically how how we'll create a, a, a base r if statement um and that's really nice because you can kind of do this one-sided things as in if it's this do that otherwise don't do anything at all just just leave it which which d plier you've always got to put the sort of the other side of it so an if else you've always got to provide the else whereas the if statement you can do sort of one-sided um so bah, 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 bah. we can also do uh an else within uh, an if else so we can do an if a is five do all of this stuff else do all of this stuff so what have we got so if a equals five then make a 10 print a is now 10 and then create b otherwise um a we're just going to print that a is a and then b does not exist unfortunately we do have b that does exist so let me i don't want to swipe it out let's i'll just pretend so what we've we got a is 10 at the moment it is going to print that B does not exist, which is not strictly true because we've already run this. But pretending we haven't run this, A is uh, five, I should have said. Why is that not printed A? That's weird. Hmm. That's very odd. Okay, well, let's just make A does equal five and then if we run that one so yeah that's converted a to ten and created i think as you're printing is it because i'm printing yeah print only does the first thing i think ah. oh yeah i should have done a paste shouldn't i okay that makes sense so i should have done a, a paste anyway cool so uh that's very very basic base r if statements um again wouldn't recommend using them the if else the, the stuff within dplar is so much tidier and and nicer however it's kind of if you do see these out in a wild um they do use the lovely curly brackets and anything that involves curly brackets is just a little bit more advanced but that's cool we're good so where are we at we're at 12 um does anybody have any specific dinner dates or anything they need to uh, specifically go to? Otherwise, my plan was to go on to about one and take about half an hour or 45 minutes, about one-ish, if that's okay. Or has anybody got to go and uh, walk a dog or uh, hit a hot coffee date? If so, shout now. We good for another hour? I, I might need to leave at half past 12. <laughs> Cool. my own lunch your own lunch lovely that my lovely husband makes for me so if that's okay but i can just leave and you can continue yes. <laughs> half 12 is that all right with everyone be right for zoe's husband bring us <laughs> it's very nice that is um well you go away and have your lunch and we just carry on working is that all right absolutely fine <laughs> um yeah, well, we'll see how we get on. If if it does look like it's a natural break at half 12, then we'll have your lunch and not make you feel guilty that we're working. <laughs> cool. So let's, uh, let's group and mutate and make some nice subtotals. So this is absolute classic. I've got a, a list of data. I've got um, a bunch of period codes. So let's just look at my data again. I've got my 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 dates and I've got my functions, my... my, uh, my organization codes and I've got my type ones and type twos and type others and basically I want to do a count of total number of attendances uh, for for March and if possible can I calculate what percentage were type ones what were type twos and what were type uh, others for March for RF4 and I also want to run that across all the different periods across all the different treatment functions create a total of attendances and then apportion out what are my percentages of type ones twos and others so what I can do is get my data I can do some lovely mutations and I want to do a new total attendance 
which will be the sum of my attendances. And then I want to do a, per a percentage attendance, which is my attendances divided by my new total attendances times 100, which will give me a percentage. And then I want to group that by two things, which is, I think, the sort of Marin uh, touched on earlier. So I want to group it by organization code and by period. So for each period organization code, I will have a total sum of attendances and also a percentage of those attendances. So let's have a look what magic that does. So now I've got new columns. So I can see my date here. I've got my one, twos and others. So I've got my total, which is my 25,000 plus my 813 plus my 2,850, which is my total attendances. So that's my total attendances in RF4 for March. And then I've got my percentages. So I've got my percentages. So that makes up 87%. That's 2.8%. And that's 9.9%. I'm sure if we add those together, that's more or less 100 uh, not that I can do maths. So basically, that's now created us a, a percentage across the, the line. And we can see that some instances where we've just got one period uh, here. Uh, and we've so we've got one period here and they've only got one type that's given us the same total. And it's given us, you know, that's 100 uh, percent, which is quite nice. So, again, just being able to group by several different things and create those totals and create those percentages across those totals is is really nice so what have we got for you we've got an over to you okay so this is hopefully relatively straightforward so our percentage attend here is pretty messy in my mind in that it has ridiculous amounts of decimal points can you basically run that and round it to one decimal place clues in the question um yeah that's the hint is that one that's for something else later on so can you find a function or something to make that come through to one decimal point and googling is absolutely allowed And without a doubt, I always, always, always get the commas in the wrong place for this. So commas are not going to be your friend here. Brackets aren't going to be your friend either. They're not my friend. In GG plot, never my friend. No? No. no. I'm no. Using, doing what we're about to do now, which I do a lot, just, I don't know, one of those every time. Do you happen to use rainbow brackets? Have I, you seen that? Or do you not like it? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. But I still, because it doesn't get in the right place either. Yeah. And, I, I did my first shiny app and that uses so many brackets that oh, it no. loses your mind, doesn't it? Especially if you're doing oh, no. yeah. Anyway, let's have a go at this. So basically we want to copy that code exactly because that's a good start. Let's not rewrite it all out. Uh, so hopefully you found the clues in the question and that there is a function called round, uh, which will allow you to uh, round your data. Uh, which is nice. So this is where it all gets really, really horrible with your brackets. So we want to do a round. Then we want to add in a new bracket to put what we've just put in there as a new um, an, a new thing. Then we need a one because it's rounding this bit. Then we need another closing bracket, and then we need another comma. And then that will 
hopefully if i'm right if i got it right if i got it right look at me i've got it right uh or is rounding our data so the really tricky bit is that this this round has this in there and the thing about round is and it kind of makes more sense if you do a simple version so on around five point uh, 5.54 blah 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 to two decimal places and then you can see it's done 5.55 to two so the thing it wants here is just straight so the thing it wants for this first function is this attendant it wants this then we've got the comma which is here and then r2 and then it wants to end bracket here but then we want another comma because we've got this by so i find that really really confusing another way that i've done it which i've made it much i've done it before which is a little bit cheating round hook attend comma one and done it that way so let's just put that that's perk attend isn't it so created my messy messy version and then fed my messy version into uh, a cleaner version uh as the next step so i created a perk attend which is my messy version with lots of long uh big decimal places and then fed it into uh, a round function it would obviously be more efficient to do it the first way, but for sanity's sake, with getting your commas and your brackets, uh, uh, would it works just as well? So again, just to say, there is there's two ways of skinning the fish. Is that that's I don't know what I'm talking about there. Definitely nearly lunchtime. So yeah, there's more than one way to uh, to to tackle that skin a fish. There is a, edit that bit out. Sounds like an idiot, right? Okay. Uh, so that's how to do uh, a nice easy round function, and I hope you found that really hard because that really I struggled with that so much. So that's great, and now we have got a lovely uh, total number of attendances, which is our total attendance, and we've done a percentage for our attendances, so we've got 80%, then 0.2% uh, of our 25,000, etc., and we've grouped that, and we've done that across all the peers. That's great. Now we want to do it for breaches, and we also want to do it for admissions, and, you know, what we could do is add in all this and do it for attendances and then we could do it again and we could do it for the breaches and we could do it blah 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 blah, blah. but let's not do that because we're super slick coders and we want to do uh we want to do it as as simply as possible and as lazily as possible especially where you want to do that same thing across a whole load of of things so let's come out with some hideous code here and I'm not going to be massively explaining it. Um, however, uh, I'll do my best. And I'm not going to make you do this because it's really, really horrible. But um, we can go and do things across um, data sets. So basically, where we have done functions, we've grouped by. So group by basically groups, rows, and does things like this. Across basically allows us to do one function, but across multiple uh multiple columns and we can do funky things like feed in some of our select stuff from earlier uh to be even cleverer so if i talk through this and don't worry i'm not going to make you do it it's quite fancy stuff but it's here and you can come back to it at a later date and just nick it and eventually hopefully by hypnosis it will start start coming through so uh, if i explain it so we're going to mutate and we are going to mutate across all our columns where we've got numerics. So basically, we will look at all our columns and uh, just mutate our uh, numeric columns. Um, and then on those numeric columns, because we haven't specified which columns those are, we can do this tilde and we can use this uh, dot, which basically tells us that this is our dot, which is our... Um, 
sort of holder for whatever our column name is. And then for whatever our column name is, we are going to divide it by the sum of the column name and we're going to times it by 100. So that will create our percentage. Um, then we want to name our new column and we're going to call it perk uh, for percentage and then whatever our existing old column was called. And then we're going to group it by our organization and our period. Uh, like say very very complex not expecting you guys to get this however it's just a, a really good example about uh and, you know and hopefully you can nick this and reconstruct it and and use it so let's have a look at what magic that does so now if we look at our data.perk we have got a whole load of these new uh columns so basically every time uh, we've got, uh, I've still got a load of these weird above 20,000 things. Um, so every time I've got attendances, it's made a percentage of the attendances. It's made a percentage of, of our breaches. And now it's made a percentage of our columns. Because I've got this weird stuff here, it's also uh, created a percentage of those. And also I've got a new attendance. Yeah, I've created a new attendance here. So it's also calculated those across and made a new column called percentage new attendance. So hopefully you can see from that very, very small little bit of code, I've calculated percentages across one, two, three, four, five columns and created new columns, uh, column names and, and did all that calculation. So um, not going to go into that masses amounts of detail uh, for that. Um, now, but just to sort of show what, what that can do. And like I said, the across function allows you to do multiple things at, at the same time. Um, but I don't think I've probably got time to deconstruct that massively. There are other ways we can do things. So for instance, if I wanted to mutate, so just across the um, columns that contain ES, for instance. So a bit like before where we had our attendances and our breaches. So maybe if I had a common factor in certain columns, I can sort of specify what that column, column is. And so if I run this one, when I run my, look at my total perk columns, I've only created now new two new columns, one for the percentage uh, of attendances and one for the percentage of breaches because those contain the ES. So it's ignored all these. So again, really, really powerful around uh, what what you can do with those four things. Like I say, a little bit more advanced than that the we're, we're doing for now, but do feel free to sort of come back to it and sort of unpick it because you can basically add in any sort of function you want within this area and create new columns across a whole load of things all at once, um, which does get really, really powerful. And likewise, because you're sort of naming them and you're giving them a sort of a, a name, when it comes to select them later, you can select everything that's got a perk in front of it. And then I know those are my percentage columns, et cetera. So it all becomes really, really tidy and, and really nice. So, uh, very very quickly uh row wise operations um so what have we got here so row wise so normally when we're doing groupings uh we are sort of grouping by sort of quite big things i say big things so when we've done groups here we've done group by period or if we've done like uh, uh or we've done group by period and by org code etc what rowwise does is basically allows us to do uh, a rowwise. Um, so each row treat as its own group. So what this will allow us to do is rowwise operations. So say I wanted to find the, I wanted to create a new column which was the maximum of the attendances, the breaches, and the admissions. If I just did a straight max of those it would just create one value which were across all of them because it would be looking across each and every column. What I want to do is find row wise. So I just want to find within the row, which is the maximum of each of those things. So that's called a, a row wise operation. So in, as I said, in, in essence, what it's doing is making each row its individual group. So within this row, which is the maximum of this or or whatever. So that's row-wise operation. So this is uh, very, very simply 
uh, I want to create uh, my data. I'm going to do a rowwise operation, and I'm going to create a new uh, a new column, which will be the max of the attendances, the admissions, and our new attendances, and that will basically be across our data set. So, if we have a look at it, so for this max call, the maximum here is our twenty five thousand. The maximum on this row is our new attendance. The maximum on this row is our new attendance. The maximum on this row is our attendances, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of having to group by each and everything, it's, it will do it. If I said, if I go back to here and we didn't do it row wise, so let's just remove that and we look at it it will do exactly the same. What have I done there then? Because I've already, oh, weird. Okay. Hmm. Maybe that's not a good example of row wise then. Okay, I'll come back to that. Anyway, but row wise allows you to, <laughs> um, I'll just skip over that. Uh, what is new attendances is missing. Uh, so I did see it. Maybe there's a bit something up here where we haven't. Where did we do new attendances? Uh, maybe you need to run this one again and add it into your data. I think my data did get quite messy. So if you run this again at five, seven, six ish, that should give you your new attendances again. Okay. Yeah, let's do this before lunch because after lunch, I think yeah, pivot wider and longer are possibly the the, the craziest things we're going to do today. So let's get that out before lunch, and then you can sort of come back and we can just coast all the afternoon. So pivot wider and longer. So pivoting uh, instantly flashes up with Excel because, you know, pivot tables and all that. And that is more or less what we're trying to do. Um, so we want to basically get our data and convert it into a different sort of format. So we often talk about uh, longer and wider, uh, but I'll try to give an example of what that means. So most of the time, what we like is nice long data sets where we've got uh, a, a row per observation and each observation is, is, is its own thing. But sometimes we want to go wide and um, convert our data into a wide format. So let's just explain what that means. So say we've got a data set and we've got our organization code is ABD. We've got a, a period, which is January, February and March. And we've got our attendances, which is 100, uh, 100, 200, 300. And we want to convert that data set into one that looks like this. So instead of having one row per observation, we want a new thing where we've just got one row for the entire thing and we want to convert this so that we our period now is a column name and our attendances sit under our month does that make sense about what we're trying to do so that's how we're trying to pivot our data around so where it was in long format we now want to make it wide format yeah, does that make sense? Anybody stuck with that? Because I know some people just go, oh, long way, it's all very confusing. Okay, so let's just make a really quick little data set just so we can kind of get our heads around it. So let's look at uh, creating a very, very simple data wide. So let's just have a look at our data. So very very simple we've got one organization code we've got one period and we've got our attendances and what we want to do is convert our periods into column names and have our attendances sit under there so we will convert this from eight rows into one row so instead of eight observations of fee variables we will have one observation of uh I'm trying to count uh in, uh, 10 variables that's right isn't it yeah because there's eight and then nine and ten i think 
I could be wrong. Could be eleven. I don't know. Ten, I think. So basically, we want the all code. I know it'll be. Yeah, no, it'll be nine because we will have the org code and then we will have each of the periods. So that'd be nine. So it'd be one that will say org code and there'll be a column title for each of the dates. There we go, nine. So we had a look at that. Hopefully you understand. And we've got a data wide um, uh, data frame, which is what we're going to work with. So if you run that one and then we want to pivot it. So we want to pivot our data wider. So we will get our data and we will pivot it wider names from our period which is basically the names of the columns that we want to create and our values are going to become from our attendances so just look at that again so we want our our columns to be named this and the values under the, our columns to be our attendances so if we run that one and then have a look at our data wide now we've got our organization code and then we've got a column for each of the dates and this number is our attendances. Note that now we've actually lost our um, uh, our variable called attendances. It doesn't exist anymore. It's it's gone. Um, it simply, you know, we would have to simply know that this date refers to the number of attendances for that date. Um, so that's why wide data is is not great. Um, one of the reasons why wide data is not great. However, sometimes if you want to output this into sort of tables and stuff, then you know that kind of uh, that kind of stuff is good. So very very quickly, uh, can you do the same? But instead of for attendances, can you jiggle this code so it does it for breaches? So hopefully that was quickly enough just to run through it, copy and paste your code, change attendances to breaches, literally as simple as that. And then we've got our breaches across. Everybody happy with that? I will assume so. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a hint there. That's fine. Okay, what you can do, and so that, sorry, I didn't notice there was bonus points. What you can do is get rid of all of that and have it in one pipe. So pivot wider is is absolutely pipeable. So then we can then make that into that, that pipe. So it all fit into, into one. Okay, so <laughs> let's do a little bit more of a of a complex version. So this time I've commented out my type ones. So when we uh, look at our data wide that we're starting with, let's just have a look at it. Now we've got our function. Uh, we've got our org code is the same again. We've got our dates. We've got our attendances. But it's also we've got our type one, two, and others for each of these dates. So when we kind of shift it wider, now what we want to do is is somehow split it out. So we've got uh, dates, and then our, but also split by our types as well. So let's look at how that works. So not too tricky. Again, we can just run exactly the same uh, version. So we still want our names from our periods and our values from our attendances. So if, so if we run that one and we look at our data wide. So now what it's done is created, uh, we still got a row per org code and type, but it's pulled all those attendances together by date. Does that make sense? But that's not too tricky. So again, same command, but because we haven't, it, it automatically recognizes that 
all code and type are sort of separate and so therefore it's created all the combinations of those okay let's look at some more complexy stuff so still remove have not got our type ones in there but we've got now we've got some different organization codes okay so we've got same again so look at our starting data we've got that same data but now we've got it across different organization codes so let's just run that same pivot again and hopefully as you would possibly expect it's now created an additional so we've got rows per organization type by other and then it's created this so it copes with additional uh, uh types and, and things quite easily so that's that's quite nice so let's do something even more complicated so now we are going to have attendances and breaches in there so previously we just had attendances and we assigned our attendances to a period what we want to do now is also uh have a column where or, or something where we've got our breaches attached to the period so if we run the basic thing that we have been running previously and we look at that uh, it causes a bit of a an issue in that that's really horrible and messy and uh doesn't work quite right in that obviously it's created a load of blanks and it's it's not quite right it's trying to create this column and it's going another column down somewhere else so i think if we order it by org code you can see it's done one set of breaches here done the admissions here and then it's kind of done this weird side so yeah nasty and horrible so we don't want that because we've only specified that our attendances are the what thing that's being split out. So it's kept our breaches uh, separate. So what we want to do is reset our data again. But this time we want our values under our period. We want uh, we want values for our attendances and we also want values for our breaches. So if we run that one and have a look at our data wide. So now what it's done is done the same again and r is also cobbled together um uh, for us some new data frame uh new data column names so we've got our attendances by each of the dates and if we scroll over to the right it's also created us columns for breaches as well so it's kind of done that automatically and sort of concatenate them to the the period so we can see that these are our attendances by the dates and these are our breaches by the dates and it's sort of put those side by side which is quite powerful and quite nice to be able to sort of chuck things through in in various different ways so um as i said there are ways i think i've put a note here obviously r at that stage has cobbled together just by default those column names you can change how those names are created and give them more specific things and there are options the way to to work out how that is is sorted but I'm not going to go massively into that data wide and data so pivot wider and pivot longer have huge amounts of uh, different functionalities that you can chuck in there to pivot things by different ways i'm just scratching the surface of what is possible so um uh yeah that's that's yeah just scratching the surface really really powerful functions definitely would worth uh checking out some of the uh the documentation on them because it's really good um if anybody hears anything, I think that's Zoe's husband coming in. So, um, you know, that's fine. I'm, I'm sure he'll be here any minute. So that's cool. Right. So uh, we've got some lovely wide data now, uh, which is here. So let's make some wide data. So let's start off with some wide data. And let's see if we can make it into long data. So let's start off with this. And um, actually, now we want to convert it back again. So I would like organization code, date, and admissions as my three columns. 
and with a, a, a row per date and uh, admissions. So without a doubt, converting long data into wide is not very pretty. Converting wide data into long data is really ugly. So it's really, really much, much more challenging. So just to be aware of that. So if you run it to this stage, that'll be some wide data. And now we want to convert it to long data. So we've got to tell our which columns we want to convert. And again, we can use a nice little bit of select um, uh, select verbs. So a bit like before we did um, contains and we did um, like, uh, which. Another select verb is starts with. Um, so if we look at our data, all the columns that we want to convert all start with a 20, which is nice. So uh, I'm just going to refer to them as any column that starts with 20. And then I want to rename that column to be called period, because previously in this, uh, we, we don't have something called period. And we want to change the values which we're converting over, and we're going to call those attendances. So if we run that one, and then we look at our pivot long, we now have a new data frame built from that, which has got our org name, our period, and back to our tendencies. Okay, so just going to do a simple example of that. Uh, pivot and wider and longer is a is a joyous rabbit hole. I hope you don't have to to go down because uh, it's uh, a challenge. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a, a quite a challenging thing. Um, pivot wider and longer, but unfortunately, it's something that we sort of have to contend with now and again. Right. Okay. Where are we at? Okay. So that's cool. Right. Let's keep going. Uh, I say I will stop at one if I see the time. If I get to one and I'm, yeah, do shout. So going to look at some other little bits of wrangling and just some nice little features and, and um, functions that we can pull in just to sort of show power of things like mutate, et cetera, that we can do, which are really, really nice. So rolling functions. Rolling functions are really, really nice if you want to sort of smooth out your data and understand things like um, sort of lengths of stay, et cetera, work, especially when you've got like small data sets and you want to try to um, uh, understand what's, what's going on. Um, so yeah, if you've got small, highly variable data sets, things like lengths of stay or like, uh, a, I don't know, referrals on a very small service, and you know it's it's small numbers which become really really variable obviously by doing a sort of a rolling mean or a rolling median or something like that you can kind of smooth that out a bit and hopefully from that sort of pull out a little bit of a, a trend so we're going to look at sort of rolling functions our rolling functions all exist in this lovely library called zoo um Zoo does also have some really nice uh, date functions in there as well. So check those out for other bits and pieces it can do. But for now, we're just going to have a look at some of its uh, uh, rolling functions. So let's just pretend that we wanted to know the six month rolling mean of attendances by each of the sites in our data. So we want to create a rolling mean as with a six month window over our our data. Does everybody understand what I mean by a rolling mean and window? Just so I'm not talking even more gibberish. And Zoe's got she bang on Zoe's husband for the lunch, isn't he? Blimey, he's twelve thirty on the dot. Wow. Uh, I'm sure ours is on its way. Don't you worry. You'll be getting a knock on the door. He's he's like Santa, Zoe's husband. Uh, apart from he's not red and fat. I don't know. Anyway, I will carry on because she's going to punch me later when she sees this bit. Right. So data role. Let's just filter our data down to uh, three sites just so it's a little bit manageable. We're going to arrange our data by organization code type and period. Again, just so it looks a little bit more manageable. And then we're going to use our rolling function. So we're going to create a, uh, a new column that's going to be called rolling. And we're going to use this role apply, which comes from our zoo library. And basically, we're going to do a role apply. We're going to apply it on our attendances. 
we are going to look at the previous six months worth of, or no, we're gonna look at six months of attendances. We're going to apply a mean to that. It's gonna be right aligned, which if you can imagine previously, we had our data set in, in date order from left is the 1st of January, then February, March, et cetera. So alignment is that we are aligning our data on the right-hand side and looking left to the last six uh, periods. And then any gaps we've got, we're just gonna fill with uh, not applicable. So we're gonna have nulls. And then we're gonna group this by our organization code and our type. So let's just have a look at what that looks like. And that's interesting. Hmm, what the heck? That's... Am I... Hmm. That's very... Am I... So there was a lovely classic example of not using an ungroup when I should have used an ungroup. So I used a row wise earlier, uh, row wise, yep, for for a thing, and I didn't do an ungroup on it, and it threw up an error for me that I had a row wise data frame. So basically, I then had to run through my data is data, then ungroup it. Uh, so naughty Simon for not ungrouping his data frame. Uh, but moving on, uh, I've ungrouped it now and I've rerun it and it has now worked. So now if we look at my data role, let's just close some of these guys down. Data role. So I've got my rolling here and... Obviously, it's looking back over the last six months. And if it hasn't got the six months in there, then it is returning a, a not applicable because there isn't six months worth of data to, to pull through. Um, so once we've hit six months, we've now got this uh, 12,057, which hopefully is the average of these guys here so uh where are we one eight nine six seven plus one one eight one two plus one 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 eight seven plus one one seven one nine plus one eight six seven eight plus one eight two divided by six look at that i can do a mean uh one two seven two five seven point five yay look at me and my maths uh cool uh, so and then obviously for the next one it's looking at from here to here so basically it's just a shifting window of of six months to look at the average over the last six months and it's done that by the period and it's done it by the organization code and for each type so when we get down to the next organization code we can see we've got gaps of the first five months and then it kicks in again uh likewise so does that make sense any issues on that i can sort of see the chat if you've got anything i can't see hands so uh hopefully that's all right so um, Simon, what will happen if you change a line to right to left well that's what we're about to do oh all right, all right. Do. Go on. So in this over to you version. So first of all, see if you can change the window to three months. Um, add an additional column that will do the median over three months and then change the alignment. So instead of looking at the previous six months, it's looking at a three month window and it's looking at the month before and a month after. So can you forget it so that it aligns in the in the middle rather than to the left or to the right so yeah if you did alignment to the left if we look at our data it would do the uh it would start here and would look forward um six months and would do an average of the the date now and the next six months so that when you got to the end of your time frame 
it would then start coming out with the NAs at this side because then you haven't got six months going forward to, to have a look. But what we want for our working example now is can we do it so that it's got a it takes the middle so it takes one and one and ahead one behind and uh, pulls through the middle window uh, as i said the joyous um question mark and help function will uh, help you considerably and there is also a hint about read your error messages So definitely start by copying and pasting the above code and tweaking it. Don't write it all out again. Oh, sorry, I've got a question. Where do we need to ungroup? If it's coming up with that grouping error, just run this data Paste the data and group, and you can just run that if it's coming up with that grouping error. That's my bad for uh, adding a row wise to it earlier. I'll pop that in the chat as well if that helps. To copy that. So. Let's see if we can sort this one out. So change the window to three months. Hopefully that's straightforward enough that you can work out. We change our six to a three. You scream at me when we get stuck. Uh, then add an additional column where we want um, a median so let's just change call that our rolling mean you may have not done this bit and you've just tweaked the other one i know some people read that wrong so i'm going to change this to rolling median and quite simply we change that from mean to median so that's quite straightforward so now i've got my rolling mean and i've got my rolling median don't have to do both of them if you, you haven't done that. And then we've got this uh, uh, with the median. See if you can calculate it on the middle time period. So this is where we've got this align. So let's just uh, roll apply. Have a look at what our options are. So a line specifies the index result should be left or right aligned or centered. So we want it to be centered. So let's do center. Oh, center, because I can't spell. Well, that's the bit where it all starts falling apart. And replace any blanks with 9999 so we can do our fill equals 9999 instead of NAs. So let's have a look at that. So this is where my crash uh, where I went wrong is in initially is argument blah 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 a line equals center Arg should be one of either center, left, or right. So it likes the American spelling of center, not the European and English version. So you have to put center, not center. So I think that's where I fell over previously. And now if I look at my data roll, I should start with a 9999 because uh, that that bit is empty and the last bit of my data set wherever that is should also roll uh, should also be a 9999 and the probably the easiest one to check is the median between these three yep yeah, we can see that one's the median when we look at these three uh, we can see that's the median etc 
uh, means probably a little bit harder to to see from play balling. Um, and then, yeah. Okay. Did everybody kind of get that? A bit that threw me was definitely the centre bit, um, just because I spelt centre wrong. Simon, if you change this number, odd number, to even with centre, when you use alignment with centre, will this produce an error in R? Let's have a look. Yes, please. Uh, it's not errored. No. Oh, interesting. Why not? Oh. Because it's now it's not symmetrical. Okay. Anyway, okay. I was doing something. <laughs> It would be very interesting. I'm sure there is alignment, and it's probably I would probably look into the documentation to see what it's doing as a default. So on this one, then. Don't worry, it's fine. It's just gone. Ignore me. <clears throat> so it's actually found the median here between these four uh so yeah that's weird yeah i don't know i'd have to look into it and um and and work out what so it has yeah it has found the median across these four um at this point so it does seem to be working at point two as it were so if that's point one and that's two three four it's taking it's it's starting here as its center it's taking point two as its center where weird but yeah definitely something to be mindful of i guess where are we we are we are 10 minutes away uh, yes make a start on this isn't too hideous so uh, the date manipulation is so uh, row numbers and date manipulation. So row numbers, really, really cool for um, calculating orders of things. So uh, quite often we want to know like referral time to second contact or what is the fifth time this thing happened or, or stuff like that. So adding row numbers and et cetera into your data set is, is really quite helpful, especially if you want to know by, by patient, Here's a list of all their appointments. What's the order of their appointments? And can I pick out the of their latest appointment? How many times have they been seen prior or something like that? It's, you know, if you've got them all row numbered, pick up the latest one and then you've got the number there. So you can say this is their latest appointments with X date and they've been seen 10 times previously or, or whatever. So row number is really, really useful. Uh, and again, like I said, for you know, quite often we come out with these joyous convoluted uh, referral to second contacts and all that kind of malarkey to try to to look at like referral terms, etc. Uh, and having row numbers allows us to do that kind of stuff quite easily. So start with uh, the most simple, I guess, <laughs> is get our data set and we're just going to filter it down to uh, three, uh, three columns. Uh, sorry, free providers. We're going to order it by our organization code, our our type, and our period. And then we're going to add a new row, uh, a new column called row. Let's just call it row num rather than a row number. Mainly because personally, I think it's bad form to call a variable the same name as a function because uh, it gets confusing. So that's very bad on me. So I'm going to call that row num equals row number. And if I run that and I look at my data row, so I've ordered it by my period and my organization code. And that's just literally given me a row number from one to 200 and whatever it is, 216 across my data set, which is, you know, great for a start. And it's basically just given it a, a very simple row number. Uh, we can do the exactly the same, but instead of, let's just remove that. See, that's very naughty of me. So again, we can do that lovely grouping thing. So instead of, uh, we want to, so at the moment, we've just got one row number per, well, for everything. It's just across the entire data set. Maybe we want to do a row number per organization uh, code and 
let's see what that looks like. So if we run that one and now look at our data row, we've now grouped it so that we have got a row number by organization. So this is RDD. We can see blah, 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 goes up to 36. Then when we move on to RJ1, it's got its own numbers. And then when we move on to whatever this one is, RQM, they've got their own numbers. So again, if we wanted to pick out what was the third, um, what was the third period in such and such, we could pluck that out and uh you know we could just do row number equals three and we could identify that so again really really helpful kind of basic ish stuff uh what we can also do is look at i'm just going to change that again is doing sort of a dense rank um so people have done sql probably make more sense so uh let's have a look at what a dense rank does so i can never remember myself uh, oh, I've missed out a bit there. So dense rank basically uh, gives all of our organization. Sorry, where are we? I've broken it. So where we've got duplicates on a period, it's given those both a number one, and then it's jumped to the next one, and it's given those a number two, those are number three. So it's just purely counted everything for the same period as number one, everything for the same period as number two, and then number three, et cetera. So instead of doing it purely where we had it previously, it was just purely sequential, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we've got like duplicate row numbers because it's saying that these are both the first by period for this organization code. This is number two by period for this organization code, etc. And then when we look at the other organization codes, we've got by by this organization code, these. So this April stuff is all row number one. Row number two is all this May stuff, etc. So it's it's grouped our row numbers. Whereas previously we would have had just one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, which would have um, made it a bit more duplicate. So if we wanted to know what were the, you know, what was the second thing that happened, this would bring it back and it would bring it across across all of these different types, uh, which again is a little bit more useful because if we wanted to then filter it down to sort of specific things, we could say what was the second uh, type one, what was the second type two or the second type other, et cetera. And we could build those into our filters, which would be quite nice. Uh, so that's sort of dense rank. We can, uh, only because somebody asked me about this the other day and it's an absolute nightmare. So say we wanted to do the rank in a reverse order. I thought you could just put a nice minus in the front of the dense rank, but that doesn't work for whatever reasons. Something I'll possibly ask Zoe about later because uh, she's super clever. But I did find a, a workaround, which is absolutely horrible, uh, that allowed me to do a reverse order ranking. Uh, let's just run that one. But I'm not convinced this is the best way, and I might might chat with Zoe in a minute when she comes back. Um, yeah, her husband's still not arrived. Might have to go for my own lunch. So basically, this does exactly the same, but it starts at the highest number and then goes down, which obviously is a much more complicated thing to do. Um, but yeah, that's what that's doing. So it's starting at the start here and then uh, converting those through. I guess the other way you could do it is just arrange your data in reverse order would be a much simpler way of doing things. Uh, but I wanted to do it this way because I'm annoying like that. So we also have something called the min rank, uh, which basically jumps the missing. So let me just have a look at that and show you what that looks like. So here, where we have duplicates across, uh, let me just organize, do that by org code. Uh, oh, is it that one? No, I've not done it there. Let's just run that again. Sorry. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. Oh, it's data row. That's why it's not working. Oh, 
Uh, so now where I've got ties, it's given all the number ones that are on the same date a one, but then it's counted how many there are and then jumped those ones. So next thing it goes to is number seven, then it will go to number 13. So it's basically uh, not filling in the blanks. So basically, if you've got two things at number one, it will go one, one, and the next thing will be three and then four and then five and then if you had two at number six it would be six and then it would jump to eight so where you've got ties it sort of jumps over those and and carries on the counting after your ties so that's called a, a min rank I'm trying to remember what the equivalent of sql is called but i can't remember so there's dense rank and any sql fans remember what the equivalent is um when you're doing all your lovely rank partition i think it's just rank actually yeah i think the equivalent is rank but i could be wrong has happened before right uh oh i'm racing against the lunch so uh okay yeah yeah we're, we're good so just a little bit of uh, a nice little date function here so just within our filter so we want to remove the year 2018 from our data set, uh, which is quite a, a challenge. Um, so we've got a data set that at the moment, if we look at our data, starts at 2017 and goes through to 2000. And is that right? 18? It's not right. Ah. Uh, it st starts at 2016, ends at 2019. There we go. Or, of course, I could have run the range function and that would have told me exactly uh, had I been uh, on the ball. I'll do that in post-production. It'd be fine. So, basically, we want to remove our uh, the year 2018. Don't know why. We just do. Um, so, I'm going to filter my data, filter it to these columns, and then I've got a between function. And I've got a period and as date and as date. So that gives me a, uh, so the between function tells me which column I'm looking at. And then I want to uh, go between these two dates. However, I've also put an exclamation mark in, in front of it, which basically tells me not this. So basically I'm going to filter where it's the, the, the date that isn't there so where date that isn't between such and such and such uh, which will remove this so if i just run this bit of data uh, this bit of code before that we can see we start at 2016 blah 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 blah, blah, blah and then we jump here from 20 uh, 2017 to 2019 so 2018 has just been removed from our data set uh, Obviously, if I didn't have that explanation mark and then we ran it through, I'm hoping you will understand and expect that what we will see is just 2018. Uh, so again, nice little bit of date manipulation. So let's go back to uh, not in between. Uh, then we're gonna arrange it by these and then we're gonna create a row number, etc. for those. And we look at our data row. And again, even though we are jumping and we've got like 2017 is missing, our row number doesn't care. It's still just going to carry on concurrently. So it's it's not a problem. So I think that was just to show that the row number is not linked to the period or anything. It's just purely the row number. And, you know, be very careful if you have got duplicate rows or periods within your data set that the row number will just yeah give it a, a a row number so that was a challenge there and also to show off this fabulous between function which is very useful for filtering dates so i think yeah there we go we've got an over to you in one minute uh, we might be two minutes late for lunch very very apologize for that where we uh oh no okay let's not do that that's really mean I didn't do financial years. Let's not do that. And we'll come back to it later after lunch because I didn't do financial years for you, did I? No, that's down here. Okay, let's not do financial years because that's too mean. Um, okay, I think then in that case, I am perfectly on time again at one o'clock. Don't worry, nobody's going home till six o'clock at this rate. Uh, where are we? We're almost like through a lot of the code. That's brilliant. 
Um, yeah, any questions? And oh, Jeanette Fraser is entered the waiting room. There we go. Sorry. Sorry, I have to go back, say thanks, sign up, blah, 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 blah. Yep, we, hopefully we can do some stuff on catch up. So, yeah, let's have some lunch. Is 45 minutes acceptable? Especially to Martin. I know what Martin you're like with your uh, eight course lunches. <laughs> Thank you for that, Simon. <laughs> yeah, you know. We know you. It's all good. Soup and a sandwich today. Soup and a sandwich. What to start, obviously, and then, then the crab firmador and the uh, eight eight meat. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, I might it, have some goo in the fridge. But they're, they're pretty good for a dessert. Zoe, if Zoe's husband hasn't come around, then unfortunately, it's everybody man for himself. But yeah, are we all right to come back at quarter to two. Any issues with that? Shorter, longer. Just some thumbs up. Awesome. Uh, uh, I don't know how to stop the recording, so that's over to Zoe. I'll just leave it running. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you at quarter two. Uh, otherwise, any other questions, chuck it in the chat and I'll, and I'll pick up in a bit. Cool. Cheers, guys. See you in a bit.
Okay. Well, I'm back in the room, I think. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. And still see screen and everything. Thank you, thank you. I will wait the other three minutes. Any major questions on where we've got to so far? Like I say, if I am going too quick, too slow, please shout, let me know. Otherwise, I'll just assume I'm doing just right. Zoe, are you here? Yes, not. Can anybody see if we're still recording? I don't know where that option is. I assume we are because we didn't stop. Um, I can't see anything. It's yes, still recording. We are still recording. Excellent. Okay. So no swearing and we're just about back on time. I'm assuming uh, hopefully somebody can edit out the lovely lunch break. Martin, I hope you got all your courses in just in just enough that you're probably on like third pudding or something. So, you know, we're all good. Right. Uh, we will skip that last um, to do and we'll come back to it at an, at another section after we've done a little bit more so uh, grouping by dates so again this is a, a classic example where we have um yeah we want to group by our dates so quite often i guess that we might have daily data that we might want to group up into monthly data or weekly data that we want to grow into monthly data or we have, might have monthly data that we want to group up into yearly data etc cetera, etc cetera. um so grouping by dates is is really quite a useful thing to be able to do because yeah chances of you having the data in exactly the right format that you want it is is slim i find so we are going to do a, a group function and we are going to do that on our on our date so we're going to get our data we're going to filter it down to one organization and one uh one type so if i just run that and we look at it uh, oh there we go i need to come out and come back in again i think i think it falls asleep sometimes but doesn't because i'm on teams and i'm sharing it doesn't actually properly go to sleep so it just kind of cuts out so hopefully that should put me back where I was. Ooh, where are we? Uh, ee, where was we? We did that bit. We did that bit. We did that bit. Yep. So I was just running this. So just look at our data year. Let's get rid of those. Yeah. yeah. So basically, we've got uh, 36 timestamps across the year for just one organization code, and it's as simple as that. So what I want to do is roll that up and group it into a year total. So I've got monthly data, and I want to roll it up into yearly total. So really uh, useful uh, function is the floor date um function which allows you to convert all your dates into uh, i don't know how to explain that uh into a sort of a, a lowest common denominator so if you had 
uh, a date and you want to floor it to the year, it would just take whatever your date was and just put it to the 1st of January for that year. If you feed it a, uh, a month piece of data, you can floor it and it will just floor that date to the start of that month. So if I gave it the 5th of April and I floored it, it would turn it into the 1st of April. And if I gave it the 8th of April, it would floor that to the 1st of April, which means then when I want to group, they're all going to be the 1st of April. Therefore, it will group all of those together. So what I'm going to do here is group by year. So at the moment, we've got yearly, uh, we've got monthly data. So I want to group all the 2017s, all the 2018s, and the 20, was that 2019? Uh, I can't see. So we've got 16, 17, and 18 for sure, uh, and group it by the year. So that's what this is doing. So group by, and then floor it by the, the period and the year. Also note that I, within my group by statement, I've given it, uh, again, I've given it an alias. So again, traditionally, you would do your group by and it would just call it um, uh, whatever you've, um, you, you've, you've grouped by. But in this case, I'm creating a new uh, variable called the year total, which is what my summarize is going to work off of. Um, so again, I'm creating a new variable. And I'm just going to do some very, very basic summarizing stuff where I'm going to do total admissions, total breaches, and for whatever reason, because I love me a median, I'm going to do median admissions. So if I run that one, and then we look at data year, as I said, we've now got a year total, uh, which is our new column name, which, as I said, was derived within our group by and now I've got a summarize by total attendances, total breaches, and, uh, and median emissions. And that's the totals and medians, obviously, across each year. Does that make sense? Any, any questions on that one? Uh, likewise, we could do that if we had daily data. We could convert that into monthly data, or we can convert that is a weekly function um, although obviously it gets really really tricky around how you uh, group stuff by weeks and how that works um, depending whether you're going sort of by pure calendar weeks or weeks within your data set etc so weekly stuff gets a little bit messy however if you have got weekly data converting weekly into monthly isn't so bad it's more that daily into weekly it's, it's just trying to confirm what your weekly uh, margin is so we are now uh, also going to do a financial year. So uh, can we convert uh, or create a financial year from our data set? So if we go back to our very, very basic uh, looking again. So we've got this, we've got our period and we've got a, a year and we've also got an organization code, etc. So we've got this period. Uh, how can I convert this period into the financial year for to work out what financial year that period comes in? So again, we're kind of looking at our our month and and, and our year to to work out what's going on. So, bit of an if else statement. So there's a month function which will tell us the the month of a date. So if I put in 2021 05 oh uh, will that work yeah there we go so that will tell us oh that's not a good example is it because i've got 05 in there twice 15 right there we go that's better so that's telling us that our month number within this date is month number five likewise we could pull out year and that'll bring up thing and this is going to shock you massively. We could put in day and it will bring back 15. So we can we can chunk up our date into individual bits. So in order to cal calculate our financial year, we can look at the month of our period. And if it's greater than or equal to four, so is it April or above, then we will take our year and we will add plus one to it which will basically, so if we look at this date, um, we would say that our, our month is five, so that's greater than four. So we will take our year and add one to it, which will make it 2022. So 
5th of 15th of May 2021 is in financial year 2022. And basically, if the... Oh, we've got somebody waiting. There we go. Uh, if our month is less than four, then we just take the period as is. So if we run this across our data and we look at our data finance, I think I've included that. So we can see these March, uh, January to March is the same year. So that's 2017. And where we've got a, a, a December, it's added on the year. So that's now in financial year 2017. So that's just quite a nice way of converting a date into a financial year for, for people who deal with financial periods. Um, that's a, a quick and way, easy way to do for that. So here we go. So yeah, come up with a really ridiculous question for you. So I want a data frame that contains a summary of sites, uh, of those two sites, returns the maximum number of type one attendances by financial year. Um, and yeah, that is a very, very silly question. So how can we how can we do that? So over to you. Definitely would re recommend nicking code from earlier. And again, just, just remember, we're not focusing on one particular feature. Some of this might look at some of the other things that we've done previously. So just because we're doing one specific bit here, we might be pulling it with other bits from other places. So let's look at, break it down. So I guess first things first is to get our data set and, uh, and then filter it. And I need to put that in speech marks. Not sure if I covered, did I mention the in for uh, filters for, for multiple things? Uh, you could use an or if it's just uh, like one or two things. We let Zoe back in, let's let Zoe back in. Uh, so yeah, you could use or if you literally had two things. So you could say org code is this or is that. However, the in function just makes that a lot, lot slicker and easier. Then we want to look at our type is one. Then we want to do our nice little funky uh, mutation to uh, turn our date into a... Uh, what is it I'm talking about? Financial year. And we want to do max attend equal max attendances. 
to uh, dot by equals c org on that. Yeah. So again, still absolutely blows my mind from coming from SQL where you can create a variable in one part of the pipe and then instantly feed it <laughs> into the next part of the pipe. Uh, still makes me smile every time I do it and makes me very angry every time I have to do something similar in SQL where you can't. Uh, so if we look at our data year, I now have, hopefully, uh, a financial year, my organization code, and my max attendances. Uh, as I said, I think we're getting a bit complicated now after lunch. Uh, everybody okay with that one? Any questions on that one? No? Wow, I'm gonna have to make it trickier for you guys. This is just just getting bonkers. So, uh, as I said, really, really nice that we've got our finance year, which then we've fed into our grouping here, which is really nice. This is our nice little function that pulls through. Uh, not gonna go capturing. So let's have a look. Uh, yeah, so this is this the one we didn't do? Adjust the code above to remove the financial year. 2017 return only the, yeah so this is this should have been the end of class one so let's have a go at this because this one's quite complicated and I'm it a, is even more question yes hello yes, i'm sorry Simon. can i ask you some tricky question for me at least so yeah. for financial year yeah uh, can you modify the script so that we see 2017-18 yeah i'm going to do that because you see, it's quite tricky given the way we calculate the financial year. So I would probably do the outside of that. So I would then do uh, finance. Let me see what's the best way to do it. Finance year equals, uh, let me see. So I would create something horrible like uh, Simon, Simon, just just before you continue, there is a lubridate function where you can yeah, yeah, where you can do fiscal start. So you can set in I can share the stack overflow. Search okay. engine search engines are your friend in this. Um where you can set your I don't understand fiscal things, but you can set your fiscal start. So I'll share that with people and that might help. Because I guess what you're doing is just trying to find the beginning of the financial year, 1st of April. We're yeah. in the 1st of April, 23, 24, aren't we? Yeah. So I've just created a new variable which put the financial year as in the end point of it. Oh, yeah. What I to do is create something. So it's so at the moment when I run it, uh, where are we? Data finance. It's converted this March 17 just to 2017. And where I've got a December 2016, it's converted that into financial year 2017. Uh, because obviously that's a that's in financial year 16, 17. I think what Marin wants us to do is have it so that it's a flash oh, yeah. 17. So I don't know the quick and easy way of doing that. There's definitely a dirtier way of doing it. Um, so, so our financial year, let's just do a horrible paste zero statement, which we will come to later in this course. Don't you worry. So, paste zero allows you to basically paste and concatenate strings together. Um, so, basically, I want my so my finance year will be the end thing I want, and I also want my finance year minus one and i want a slash and i want my finance year i think it's as simple as that could be wrong let's have a look let's have a look at what that looks like there we go it's not not beautiful but it would do and if we wanted to remove the 20s we could also look at removing those as well if we so wish but is that broadly what you're after? 
Yes. Um, yes, Simon. Yes, perfect. Yeah. Okay. No, it was quite easy for you. Okay. Right. <laughs> Come on, Marin. You can find something tricky for me. I'm sure. <laughs> I will. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so I've got a really horrible one for you here. So, uh, so just the code above, which I think possibly means below, because I think I've gotten a little bit order, weird order. So we want to remove the financial year 2017. So first of all, we want to calculate our financial year, and then we want to remove it. We only want the first three rows for each, for only type one of each organization. So we want to filter it to type one and only return the first three rows and let's forget about the bonus points because that's just silly yeah let's ignore that one so let's just go with that so adjust the code that we had before uh, around trying to find the financial year add in the sort of row numbers and then see if we can just bring in the first three row numbers for each organization does that make sense so Again, absolute stupid question. Um, but hopefully it's just a case of combining some of those things in a bit more of a chunkier, chunkier way. And yeah, oh, actually, it doesn't make sense. Okay. And I guess because we haven't actually used, we're not using financial year anywhere else, you don't necessarily have to calculate it, although it's possibly a way that you, you, you can do. I always think these questions are absolutely bonkers until you get to that point where you end up having to do something as bonkers as this. Yeah, that financial year was one of them, isn't it? It <laughs> catches me out. We have different things, don't we? For Dates are just a nightmare. Dates, well, I mean, I'm going to have to say it out loud. I guess, especially if you're sort of coming from an Excel background where it treats everything as a date. <laughs> classic incel excel uh, venn diagram uh <laughs> treats everything as a date but yeah there's the there is the excel bit which kind of converts everything to a date and everything is really so if you look put five minus two it will usually convert that to the fifth of february uh everything to a date whereas i think in r and python and uh, you you really have to be specific that this string i'm churning through i want to pass as a date and um yeah that's really really quite a quite a thing uh to, to sort of make sure that we do pass dates as as dates and yeah they are one of the trickiest things to to work with um just checking so what time were we due to finish today i've got it in my diary for a long time i don't think um that's another... necessarily what you want uh is that what you're saying i've got it in until five five <laughs> i don't know if that's the same for everyone i think that's the meeting request is till 4 30 even okay that's better i can't uh, read times on my outlook but time. um okay 4 30 is you know i would endeavor to, to to get us through it uh before then if i can but conversely i want to chuck as much stuff at you guys as possible so you know let's make the most of it um, obviously, we are recording. The stuff is available. If you do need to drop out, then, um, you know, do feel free to do so. But, you know, let's try to make the most of it as as we possibly can. Though. So let's have a look at this. So what we'll be doing, we were... Uh, da -da 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 -da. Adjusting the code to bring remove the financial year. So I think we can copy this code and tweak it so uh i'm just choosing these three organizations i don't know if you've done that that's that's fine so i can just remove the um financial year just by 
twiddling this without having to um I think that's probably a bit of a red herring uh what I did earlier um so we can just do uh do a financial year removal there um which is a bit cheeky alternatively you can calculate it and then filter it out uh, if you so wish there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that um and it's uh, as i said i think there is a little bit of a hint here so say we did do it the other way so let's just start with our filter then where's my mutate there's my mutate let's bring that in uh where am i yeah yeah so there's my new mutate to create my new uh, function. Uh, ooh, yeah, my, let's get rid of that. I'm in a right mess now where my code is because I think I've jumped over two different bits. So that, blah, 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 and I need uh, another one. Ah, is that right? So I've got my data, data row. I'm definitely on the wrong bit, but don't worry. So there you go. I've created my data set and I've created my financial year. I've already done a filter here, but as I say, I think within the hint, uh, wherever it is, this isn't SQL. So if I want to now add in another filter, because I've now created something I want to filter on, uh, you know, this isn't SQL. You can, you can do that. So now I can filter financial year equals... Uh, what is our financial year? I can't remember what we're trying to get rid of. 2017, is that right? So 2017. And I can also do uh, either a not, I can either do a not equals 2017, or I can do a not financial year equals. Personally, I find it easier to do the not equals here because I think that's a little bit easier because I often miss the minus here. So if I do that... And I go back to my data row that will remove my 2017. So I could do it either way. So I could do it within the the, the filter above, or I could have uh, calculated my um, filter there. Then what am I doing? I am adding a row number. So let me just do an arrange and row number, I guess. So what am I doing? I am uh, arrange by all code type and period. Then I want to uh, add in my row num. Which is a row number, and I want to group. Ooh, what have I done there? I've missed a thingy there. Right there we go. Then I want to group that by my uh, org code and type, and I need to put an underscore in that. So what does that give me? Uh, blah, 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 blah. Where am I? So that's giving me all those. That's fine. And then I wanted to, what is it? I wanted to, so again, I can just add in another filter. <laughs> and row num. Uh, row num less than four. And add in that. So I think the example there, just to go one, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three. I think my example there is just to say that, you know, you are not limited in your pipes to doing things like you are in SQL where you've got to do your select and then you've got to do your such and such. And if you've got a where and order by and having and group by, it all, it's all got to be in a really specific order. 
not saying this is necessarily the best practice way of doing things, but just to show you can do a filter and arrange. I've got an arrange in there twice. I don't think I needed that at all. Uh, but yeah, you can do your filter, arrange, and mutate, create a mutate, then do another filter, add in then a new column based on this things once you filter it and then filter it again. So, you know, you can create these wonderful, uh, crazy pipelines of, of stuff. Wouldn't recommend doing it too much if you can if you can try to group things together and and do it as, as many a fewer things as possible but just to say you know it is possible uh, i guess that is out there and i think again coming from the beginner stuff this kind of really blew my mind it's like what i could do another filter on a thing i've just done and then filter that and yeah, yeah. so it's all it's all good so did everybody go can you share the script together and the answers at the end. No, I can't. But if you look in the files here, we have a student version and then we have an intertrain version and that intertrain version has got all the answers in it. So I'm not gonna do it at the end. I've already done it. So there we go. So yeah, it's all there with the answers in the intertrain version. Um, so yeah, it's there for you already so we've done the over to you so we've done some grouping by dates we did that one sorry we jumped up so possibly uh going back to Marin's point uh earlier about how do we sort of uh cut up strings and pass numbers and do some some interesting things there uh let's do a very very quick bit of um Oh, yeah, it's all on the GitHub too, which is awesome. Uh, so let's have a look at some quite nice functions that we can sort of pull out. So there's a really nice function called pass number, which allows us to just pull out the numbers from a string. Um, I'm not going to go into it now, but there's also a really nice, uh, I can't remember, it's on what library it is off the top of my head, but there's a really nice function called pass date. Whereas if you've got one of those lovely Excel sheets, which obviously you've sent out to everybody to fill in and they've all filled it in with their own version of a date and you've just got this column of 50 different date formats and uh, it's an absolute, you know, some people have done it as slashes, some dates, some people spell it out, blah, 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 blah. The really nice function that just basically reads all of those things and just coerces it into a date. Uh, even if you sort of feed through loads of different formats, it will try to find the date out of it. It's, obviously, it's not 100% perfect, but, you know, it can't necessarily tell if somebody has put in the 5th of May as English format or American format. So things like that, where it's a little bit uh, ambiguous, it will possibly fall over on. But for the grand scheme of things, it's amazing. So I will dig out that and I'll make sure I put that in sort of follow up stuff. Anyway, pass number basically looks at a string and just pulls out the numbers from it. So if we just run that one across our data set, it's giving us some warnings, which is fine. Um, and it's telling us we've got some errors in our passing, which is fine. Uh, uh, like I say, just a warning message, so not a problem. Um, it just means that we've got some things that didn't quite ma match. And if we go to our data or code number, so basically what it's done, it's gone to this RF4 and our org code number, it's pulled out the four. And for this RF4, it's pulled out the four. For this R1H, it's pulled out the one. So quite a nice, useful little function. It's giving us some warnings here because obviously it's looked at R, Y, X and it didn't find a number. So it's just telling you that it's had to pull through some uh, NAs because there weren't any in the data. So that's basically what that, that warning is telling us. So nothing too much to be concerned about. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's quite useful. Uh, we can also do things like string detect, which I think we sort of, a little bit like the contains earlier um and i think we did a little bit in our in our fancy filtering so we did a data filter and we want to filter our data where the org code has got an r in it or this is our little r, uh, r slash again or it's got a p in it so if we look at our data filter we've now filtered our organization codes that only those that have got an r in it or a P. I don't know if there's any particular ones which jump out as weird ones. No, so 
Uh, anyway, so yeah, if it's got an R or a P in it, we filter a bit to that. So um, over to you. What organization codes have a number in them over 50? So can you return a data frame with just the organization codes of those with a number over 50? So basically, I would like just one column of organization codes where we have got uh organizations with with uh over 50 in their organization and just one row per organization so again might want to think back to uh some of the stuff we've done earlier really mean because that's making you think about several things at once so as i say i want a data frame it's just got a list of the organization codes the individual organization codes over that have a number over 50 in them Um, I have to check, Zoe, but I think it is the past eight package that does sound like it does what it does on the chin. Yeah, it looks amazing. <laughs> Never seen it before. It's like Isn't it? all of your dreams and all the problems and all the nightmares, dreams and nightmares, dates, all in one. Like I think we've had up. A spreadsheet, haven't we? Hmm? Where I think we've all encountered that spreadsheet that's got like the 50 ver versions of dates in it. And a mixture of US and UK format always uh, catches me out. So there's a US date in there and it throws out everything because it can't exist in a UK format or the other way around and everything well, crashes. Yeah, one's put 1 May, one's put 1 May 23, one, 1 May 2023 and then 2023 slash 5 slash 1 and all of those things. And you can just feed but the entire row, the entire column to it and it will pretty well do its best to convert it all into a reasonable date which is just magic right let's see if we can do this so this is a bit of a combination of some of the things we've done earlier so whoop, let's type on the screen that would help wouldn't it so let's do our data field so we want to take our data and we absolutely want to nick this bit out of here, which will give us our organization code number. Ooh, what have I done? That's not right. That's right. Uh, there we go. So this will give us our organization code number. Then we want to filter our org code number is greater than 50. Ooh. Then we want to select just the org code. Then getting right back to where we started from, we just want to bring back the unique values. How about that? So if we run that bad boy, it's again giving us some warnings that we've got some of them where it's come through as as false, and then we can look at this. So this is the unique list of our organization codes where we've got a number over fifty. Again, really sorry for cobbling lots of stuff together, but I think that's where you know we we can see how wonderful R is that allows us to do some of those things. So. Is that cool? Does that make sense? Even if you didn't quite get the answer, hopefully you can at least follow along about how you would potentially tackle that. And I definitely know from my art journey that 
if you don't know that kind of stuff is possible, then you you know you don't you don't know what you don't know. So yeah, hopefully this is hopefully this is helpful. All right then. So uh, strings. So sometimes we have some really long strings and sentences that we would like to shorten. So uh, there's a couple of ways that we can do that. So let's just create ourselves a really long sentence. And our sentence, if we look at it, is this is an example of a long sentence that I would like to shorten as it is far too long. So what we can do is call our sentence and we can basically to a, a substring of our um, of our sentence. And we can say that we want to make a substring of our sentence we want to bring in our example we want to start at point one and stop at point 15 which will basically bring back the first 15 characters of our string which will basically give us this is an exam and then it will just obviously just cut it off because obviously it counts spaces as as a character and it will just bring back the first 15 uh characters of the of the thing if we want to obviously we don't have to start at one we can start at five and that will bring us something in the middle if we if we so really really wanted to however that's not great uh that's that's not so perfect so what we've also got is a really nice function uh which is the word function um so basically if we just want to bring back the first four words of a um uh, of a string we can do that so so here we're going to look at our example i don't know why but it's worth just noting that it doesn't use stop it uses end so we're going to start on word one end on word four and it's just confirming what is the separator between our words uh obviously most of the time it is a space but sometimes you might have something like i don't know apples Swish, banana, something like I can't even spell banana. Look at that, uh, banana. Is that close? Or is it double ends? I don't know. Something like that, isn't it? Anyway, you might have a banana, banana and you want to split that out from apple. In which case, you could put a, a dash in there, and then we would be able to pull out the first part or the second part, uh, depending on that. So, if we look at word, that will bring back the first four words of our sentence. So this is an example. So again, likewise, if you want to play around with that and change that to two to eight or, or whatever you want, it will sort of jump through and, and pick out certain bits, which starts getting quite useful, especially when we get to, um, I've had things like treatment function codes, which all end with like ridiculously long names and things. And my absolute classic, which we're going to go through now is really long hospital names and ICB names and things like that, which when you want to put them on a graph or in a table and, they're, and you know, they're called Boggins University Hospital NHS Trust University Hospital Trust. And it's like, and you've got 20 of those and you're trying to fit them on a graph. It all becomes really, really messy. Obviously, you can hard code them to sort of change them and give them shorter names. However, what is much nicer is trying to work out how to make it a bit more dynamic and, uh, and sort of remove stuff more dynamically so that you can just apply it across your data set without having to, without having to worry stuff. So we're going to start ourselves off with... Uh, a long hospital name. So our long hospital name is Boggins University Hospital NHS Trust. And we want to change that for our lovely little chart or our table just to read Boggins Hospital. OK, just because that's going to be much as much readable. And to be honest, for most of the readers who's going to read the report, they know which hospital Boggins Hospital refers to. So that will be fine. So we are going to do it using a nice little library called TM, uh, which is a text mining library. Um, if you want to get really, really into sort of data science text mining, library TM is your go-to. It's amazing. And you can do some really funky things with it. However, we're just going to sneak a little function out of it um, just for our little use here. And the, the use that we're going to use here is the remove words function, which basically allows us to give it a, a bunch of words that we want to remove from a string. So it will just look through the string 
and just remove them. So let's convert, uh, let's call our library to start with because I want anything in a work. And then we're going to look at short hospital name. So now when we look at our short hospital name, it's come through as Boggins Hospital. However, uh, we've got a few minor, minor, minor issues here in that it's not coped with the white space whatsoever. So it's literally remove the words, not the white space. So uh, I think it's my my favouritest function in the whole of R, just because it's got the most stupidest name ever, which is string squish, uh, which is just awesome. Um, which allows us basically to feed a string into it and it will squish it down into and, and remove all the est, uh, est, esteroneous, I was going to say. If that's not a word, it should be. It will remove all the extra white space within uh, a string. So if we run that across it, it will remove any leading spaces. If we've got double spaces, it will just convert them into one. And if we've got any trading spaces, it will remove those. So string squish is just awesome because it does what it says on the tin so that's that's brilliant and we can also run that across uh you know we can also feed that into a data frame and we could run that across all our different hospital names and you know by the end of it we'll we'll be there however if we look at our our note here we're still not quite there we seem to have a bit of a problem and uh, a spelling issue so we've got an annoying rogue capital P in our hospital name. So over to you guys. Can you find a function? Uh, and I'll give you a clue. It's a str underscore function where we can fix our Boggins hospital and uh, change our uppercase P to a lowercase P. So a bit of Googling time. I don't know who names Green String Squish, but it has the, I mean, it just does what it says, doesn't it? It's perfect. I couldn't, yeah. I think a lot of the functions in um, D plus specifically, they're just great names. Oh, not just D plus. Per is also really good because they're just good names. They do the same things. You can do it in many different ways, but who wouldn't want to use things like String Squish? Str squish. Awesome. So, um there is there is also a, a string remove so i have used um the the tm function here to do remove words there is a string remove function as well which does more or less the same um which you can do um i just like remove words because that's how i started but however yeah string remove does exactly the same so we want to change uh, a, a, yeah, we want to change our uppercase P to a lowercase P. Uh, anybody paste in the chat what they came up with or what function they have found? Five points, whoever gets there first. Everybody forms. We've got one. String replace. String to lower. Okay, nice. String to title. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. Lots. So, yeah. So, uh, strings. Let's try a couple of those. Uh, so, string to lower would literally do what it says on the tin and convert everything to lower, I think, doesn't it? If I remember rightly. Uh, so string to lower. Uh, where are we? That one. I'm gonna I'm gonna call this uh, T. Otherwise, I'm gonna overwrite it every single time. So string replace to lower that 
which gives us I don't need to write that, do I? I can just do that. Uh, so string to lower. What? Where's that gone? There. Gives us Boggins Hospital, but then everything's sort of lowercase then. String to title. I think it might actually work. That's quite a good one. I didn't think of that. So string to title does work perfectly. So that will basically capitalize uh, whatever you've got. So what you could do potentially is if we have that as that converts it to lowercase. So we've got lowercase and then we could do string to title A, which would then pop it back into a uh, hospital. That's quite nice. Um, I think the string to title is probably the best answer. You can also do a string replace. So if we thought it was just a very specific thing, we could do short hospital name and uh, where are we? We want to replace any P's with a little P and that would, where are we? Oh, I've got the wrong one. Uh, I need to go right back up here, don't I? Do, 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 do. And all that, that's going to fall over there. That's fine. Uh, yeah, and if we just look at my short hospital name, make sure I've got it right. Yeah, and then we could do string replace the big P to a little P, and that would change that too. So, yeah, brilliant. Well done. Have we got some other possible examples? String to title, everything. Yes, everything lowercase now. Two upper changes, everything to upper. I mean, wow, who would have thought that would have happened? Uh, yeah, so that's that's really cool. Um, there are, there is a really nice, um, another library called uh, Snake Case, which allows you to convert all your <coughs> all your data into sort of snake case or upper or various other different more sort of data -y formats as well. So a bit like the um, clean names, which we did like five years ago across our titles, you could also do that across your variable names uh, or your variables if you so wished. Um, but I think the two title is the the probably the one that we should go to. Okay, that's cool. So introduction to factors. Okay, so again, not going to go massively deep into this, but. Obviously, we've been dealing with data, and I'm sure you've noticed that when we've been running with this data, we've got a bunch of data. Oh, my goodness me, I've got loads of crap in here now. I? Uh, we've got loads of data which has come through as numeric. We've got a date, but we've also got a couple of things. Well, if you look at them uh, within our actual data, uh, they just look like uh, organization codes and <laughs> type, which you would have thought would have just been a character. However, they've been, they seem to have factors. So what is a factor? So the most basic use of the factor and the best use of a factor is basically it turns a character into an ordinal data type. So if you can imagine, I don't know, low, medium and high is, is your, you know, probably a classic. We could change the string low, medium, and high and give them a factor. And then we could also then order, give those factors an order so that we could say low comes first, then medium, and then high. So basically, you're, you're creating uh, an order for uh, a character type. So we're creating ordinal data. So obviously, we haven't got, this isn't a numeric thing. This is trying to give an order to a, a character string. Um, does that make sense? Is that a very quick and dirty explanation of ordinal data? So imagine, you know, big, small, you know, if you wanted to have those in an order, that's that's really useful. So let's have a look going back to our lovely attendance groupings that we did however many years ago. So we're going to look at our data and we're going to filter it just to one period and, and one type and look at our data groups. So our data fact here. We have got our period and then we've got our attendance groupings. If you remember our lovely case statement, we created a groupings for our attendances. Now, if I order my data by my attendances by clicking on my attendances, we can see that obviously our attendance groupings match 
our data in that way. However, if I then just click on the top where it says attendance grouping, it's not ordered them by, uh, it's just basically ordered them alphabetically. Um, so right at the top, we have 10,000 to 900, then we have 15, then we have 25, then we have five, and then less than. So even though we've created a grouping for our attendance, R doesn't, hasn't got an order for those groupings. As far as it's concerned, it's just putting them in alphabetical order. So if we do our unique uh, data, uh, where are we, uh, attendance grouping, basically it's it's yeah they're not in any order whatsoever they just all spit out and so like i said it's just gonna be alphabetical orders so it will take this one first then this one then this one then that one then that one etc so not ideal what we would like is is to have our attendance grouping and give that some sort of uh order so let's just have a look what it looks like when we haven't got uh, an order so we're just going to do a really super quick plot on our data I said we'd do some plotting at some point, um, and then let me just zoom in that. So when we've plotted our data, it's put our attendance grouping, again, just in alphabetical order, which is a bit rubbish. Obviously, if I was going to plot this, what I would like to do is have it in actual order. And, you know, if I was plotting something with the numbers, obviously I would just automatically put things in the right order. So what we want to do is create an order for convert our string, which is our, our column names, our, is our variable names at the moment, and convert those into a factor. So that is what we're going to do. So we're going to take our data uh, and our data fact, and we're going to mutate our attendance grouping and we're going to turn it into a factor, which will be our attendance grouping. And then we can give it various different levels and we basically order those levels. So they basically go from, I guess it's not really necessarily lowest to highest, just from first to last, as in whatever order they are. So if we wanted to put high as our first thing, we would just have put that first and then go down to low. So you can create whatever kind of order for stuff as you as you would like so if you've got like things like uh, a, a survey say where you've got like strongly disagree disagree neither here and there agree strongly agree and you want to be able to sort of plot stuff in that kind of order you can create that sort of ordinality between your data sets so let's run that and let's run exactly the same bar chart again and see what magic that does. So now when we've run our bar chart, it's put them in that order. Likewise, when we look at our data fact and we look back up here, and now when we do our attendance grouping and we want to do ordering by attendance grouping, it has actually ordered them in that same order. So now in our data frame, if we did an arrange on our data frame by attendance grouping, it would arrange it by our order that we've we've given it. Um, that comes in really handy when you've got things like, uh, I mean, I work across ICBs. So quite often we have a very specific order that we like to put our ICBs in, and it's not necessarily alphabetical. For, for reasons and sometimes you might have hospitals that might be obviously within an ICB and you want to order all your hospitals so you can give them you can sort of like put them in the right order so that they would then match up to the appropriate ICB or, or whatever so just a really really nice little thing so I'm not going to go massively into sort of functions more than that um, just a very very quick overview of what they are so when we look back now at our I know it's not that one is it it's our data fact now we've got an attendance grouping it's telling us that we've got six levels uh, let's just move that across 
uh where are we uh attendance we've got six levels and it would also tell us sort of what order that they come in as well so that sort of grouped those together so it's it's another sort of grouping um within our within our data set but yeah i think that's probably as deep as i want to go with factors there are ways of setting up your factors a little bit more dynamically so if you wanted to um create um uh, an ordinal an ordinal level based on another data point you can do that so you can almost make your bins come from the data etc but again probably haven't got time to go through it now so let's do a very very quick bit of dynamic text which is probably what i touched on very earlier and i'm just going to show you the absolute basics which is paste other uh versions do a uh a, a, which we'll go into another point. We can go into glue and all the, the new epoxy as well. So basically, we want to concatenate a string together. So um, a bit like I did earlier where I made the financial year and I pasted two things together, this allows you to sort of paste uh, strings or multiple things together. So very, very briefly, um, it's just a paste zero and then brackets. And then you can just paste together um, either individual variables or multiple variables and text. So you, and as, as many combinations as you want. So I'm now going to do a paste zero and it will say the maximum number of tendencies was. So that's just a bit of text. And then it's just going to read through my data and bring out the max attendances and then just split that into a single sentence. So when I look at my text. It will just say the maximum number of tendencies was 32,209, which I assume is correct. Um, and you can also sort of put commas and sort of make multiple things. So on this version, uh, we can do uh, the maximum number of tendencies was the max, and then do another bit where it says, and the lowest was such and such and then we can sort of pull that through and uh, have dynamic text so that's the absolute starter for 10 for creating dynamic text um i'm really like doing dynamic text and um i think i'm going to do a bit of a workshop on it at some point where we can look at charts and tables and sort of again sort of bring out more analytical text to explain what's going on um and with some sort of nice little case statements and some if else's we can really describe a data set really quite well so yeah let's uh, catch up with that later so where are we at we are at 1445 okie dokie so we're good we're good we're good so we're going to do some uh spcs because who doesn't love an spc chart so the wonderful R community um, jumped on board with the, the Making Date account. We were got really, really impressed by the whole Making Date account thing, uh, but we're all super lazy and we hate Excel. So the last thing we want to do is use that hideous Excel template or the, the version where you have to put like 50 different things in all at once and it just splits out a mess. So uh, I think we sort of came together and built ourselves our own version of the uh, plot the dots so we have an nhsr plot the dots which allows us to build really really quick and uh, very nice spc charts so that's what we are going to do now so first of all we are going to take our our data we're gonna filter it down to a single organization code and a single uh organized sorry a single type so if we look at our data spc Basically, we've got uh, 36 um, data points, each with one period. And basically, I think we just want to plot our attendances and see what that looks like. So at the absolutely most simplest level, we can create uh, an SPC using our plot the dots SPC function. And at the lowest level, we can just feed in our attendances and our periods and it won't be beautiful and it won't be perfect, but I hope you can see that within sort of one function with two inputs, we can create ourselves an SPC chart. 
Um, all the control lines built in there. Uh, this is a really bad version because we haven't got any colors on there. But if we did have anything going up and above the control limits, those would all be appropriately colored in. We do have a C just to say that we're within common cause variations. So we're in our, our limits. And again, we've just got the most basic title on there. But hopefully just from a single line, we've got the most basic SPC chart. So that's great as a absolute start for 10 but it's not quite what we want so over to you and again this is about how can you look at a function and see what else it can do so this is our our question so take that take that what i've just done literally copy it there and can you work out how we now want to add in a target for our um our spc and we also want to show that improvement is a reduction and not an increase, which is the default. So I aim for about a three o'clock-ish break. And very sorry, we haven't done lots of pretty graphs today. I think I need to add a few more colourful sparkles in the middle just to keep everybody awake. Oh, when you say sparkles, people like spark lines, don't they? I'm not sure. Did people you, don't. Did you Spar like them and you you didn't like them? Do you like them or didn't like them? I can't remember. I know you've talked about them before. Very much dislike a spark line. Ah, okay, so you're not going to show us then <laughs> on principle. Thank you. Well, Excel's, I think spark lines are good if you use the full, was it Tufty or whatever his name is, Tuft version, where the, so the Tuft version has a little data point and it will tell you what the min max is on that and what the current bit is. Where you've just got the Excel or the Tableau version where it's just the line with nothing on it, it's just the squiggle because there's no concept of scale. It could go up from one to two or it could go from one to 20 billion and it would be exactly the same line and that really bothers me especially when people say that's the trend you know if i see that spark line in that that rag rated dashboard and it's just got that trend thing because you don't know how much it's changed by you there's no there's no way of telling so it might look like it's nose diving but it might have just changed by one percent or it might have changed by a hundred percent you don't know so I just think they're really dangerous and awful. There are some nice versions in GT. So you've got to be started and ranting now. We were by T, but not anymore. And it's all Zoe's fault. Um, but yeah, there are some nicer versions which allow you to do hover overs and to do include uh, a min and max. And I think you can use those in GT table. So when I do my lovely GT table masterclass one day, I will show you how to do a proper spark line. And that would be cool. But spark lines generally, yeah. Anyway, so rant over. Let's get back to where we was. Uh, so let's have a look at what is in our, whoops, what am I doing? What is in our plot the dots feature? So what have we got? We've got uh, an option here to add in a target. That sounds like what I'm after. I can do target equals, what am I, uh, 17500, and improvement direction equals decrease. There we go. Now, when I plot it, we've all got a little bit different. So we've now got a <laughs> lovely target line up here. I don't know quite why I put it up there, but that's... Uh, yeah, what well, came out, obviously, we are way, uh, uh, where are we? We are trying to get, we're trying to get low as possible, aren't we? Improvement direction is decreased. So actually, look at us, we're doing brilliantly. We are way below our target because we didn't want to go above that. So we've got a, a P to say that we are assured that we are con consistently passing this and we are within common cause variation. So actually we're in a really good place for our attendances sorry this is obviously a, a a 
scenario that I'm obviously not used to uh, a KPI being on target and under control. So sorry for me being a little bit, well, what's going on there? Um, yeah, very, very rarely see this. So that's cool. So hopefully got that. Um, we can also do things like add in facets. I'm sure you guys have done uh, facets before. So we can look at our organization code and we can do a facet across each of our different types. So let's just run that and we can sort of zoom that through and we can see our differences here for our type one attendances, our type two. And finally, we've got some blobs for our type three and we can see that these were looking good and these guys are looking bad because that's suddenly jumped up higher and we are had a, a run above our mean and also we are outside of our control line so these have come up as our orange so we're on the noise step so those are great but um it's not looking you know again that's sort of something that's chugged through in a couple of a couple of lines um so we can turn our SPC chart into a sort of a GG plot object, which allows us then to add lots, much more sort of niceness to it. Is that the word? I'm not sure niceness is the right word. Um, we can make it prettier. That's the word, isn't it? Yeah, pretty. So let's just take our basic uh, plot, which we've just done. And now we want to feed it into a uh, a ggplot so we've created our object here which is this and then we're going to feed this into the plot the dots create ggplot uh feature which allows us to do lots more sort of tweaking and wrangling so previously where we had um uh yeah so let's have a look what that looks like is probably the best answer so now uh we've tidied up a few bits and pieces of it I've changed it so that each of them are on uh, their own scale now. So it's not on a, a fixed scale. So hopefully we can see a little bit better of what's going on. It's probably still a little bit. I probably need to make it wider to make it a little bit nicer. Um, I've adjusted the dates so they look a little bit tidier. And yeah, just overall, that's a little bit neater. And, you know, not too bad for a couple of lines changed here. Um, I've also changed it so that the axis breaks on the uh, on the plot is every two months. So again, it's just sort of stopped it being quite so squishy and squished up. So a little bit over to you now. So let's see if you can do a faceted plot for type one attendances for those um, those sites. See if you can change the point size so that the dots look a little bit nicer. Personally, I think they're a bit too blobby. See if you can make them a little bit smaller. Uh, that's just me. Uh, see if you can change the access, X axis label so it says date rather than period. Uh, anything else you think that would make it nicer. And for absolute bonus points, see if you can use paste or something to make a dynamic title for the for the chart. And that's absolutely mega bonus points. So don't worry if you can't.
Got 30 seconds more. More, oh, how are we doing? Please do shout if I am just going way too fast. Otherwise, I will carry on going way too fast. Okay, if I break it down bit by bit. So we're going to start with our data set, which is our data, filtering it to these uh, three up here, and also our type ones. Always a good idea, just have a quick eyeball of our data. So we've got our three organization codes. We've just got our type ones, and we've got our period. So we're all good. Then we want to chuck it into the same as we did up here. But this time we want to facet on our organization code and not our type. So if we just did our absolute raw version of SPC, we get this beautiful um, Jackson Pollock, uh, I think it's called, uh, but we don't want that. So that's our absolute basics. But again, really, really good to see that we can just sort of run through, run through that and just get an eyeball of what that looks like. And again, if we zoom out of that, again, we don't, I don't like all these dates. That these are all weird and it's all wrong. And yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's remove that and let's pop that into an object. So let's have a look at what we've done. So we've already messed about with our dates and converted those into a nice format. We've done uh, we've done our breaks into two months. We've got a point size now of two, which just makes those big dots less clumpy in my mind. Uh, we've also changed our x asset x lab x axis x I can't say it x axis label. Uh, oh, Zoe's run away. Okay, cool. Uh, to uh, date, and we've also now changed our main title, and I've chucked it into a paste where I've taken the unique organization codes from my data up here. So I've not hard coded them. So if I change my data up here, it will dynamically change in my data set, and I've just converted that into a string. So if I run my Plot the dots now. I get, oh, that's interesting. I get a very weird title which has gone wrong. So I need to look at, oh, because I've done data rather than data SPC. That's why I've brought in all the names from all of the things. Let's just try that again. There we go. Uh, so, yeah. So now, Personally, I much prefer it with the smaller dots. I think those look much more professional charts. Uh, I've got a nice title which tells me it's for these three sites. And as I said, if I change my uh, site names uh, in, in my data set, my chart will update automatically, which is nice. Um, there's a bit of contention about whether we should keep things on the same scale or not. Um, I'm guessing it depends on what you're trying to show and what the differences between the, the, the places are. So, I mean, very much here, by the looks of it, these are very similar hospitals. Uh, so that probably on the same scale absolutely makes sense. And I guess having this on a similar sort of scale also means that we can do that sort of fair comparison uh, to con see what they look like. If we... If we change that back to a false uh, and run that one, we give them their own. Uh, we give them their own uh, scales, and I guess there's that little bit of a danger about because they're now on a different. Oh, they're each on their own scale. If we are doing that comparison one against the other. It's just very tricky that, you know, picking out the highest on one and then compare it back. So it, it totally depends on what your analysis is trying to say, uh, I guess, is the, is the best practice there. So just be very, very mindful of floating scales, et cetera, um, depending on what your analysis is, is for and what it's trying to say. I mean, I guess just by eyeball, I don't know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? I don't know if I was going to compare those two in each other. 
it doesn't show clearly that this is way above this one. In fact, the fact that it's got a couple have gone lower, that, you know, I don't know. Anyway, totally depends on what your analysis is for and what you're trying to say with it. So, okie dokie, my blimey, we are at three o'clock. Okay, dokie. Oh, yep, yeah, we're going to take a quick break. That's what we were going to do before we get into very, very, very basic functional programming. Don't get scared by that. It's super simple what we're going to do, and we're not going to do anything too scary. So we are at five minutes past the three o'clock. Uh, if we can come back at quarter past, um, definitely take a stiff coffee. None of this is going to be too hideous. We're going to do some basic, very, very basic functions show you how cool and useful those can be for just repeating parts of your code. Um, I think we're going to do some very basic for loops, and then, then I think you get to go home and we're all done. So, yeah, not too bad. Home stretch. Last coffee. Can you roll down your code for the last bit? Yes, I can. There we go. Uh, I'll pop that into the chat if you just want to copy it as well. That's just as easy. But again, I think it's about putting the sort of like unique stuff into a string and then into a pace in order to come up. I don't know. Right, so it's just joining all these amazing functions together to, to do amazing things. Right. I'm going to go and grab a coffee. See you at quarter past.
<sighs> okay, I just looked forward, I think, probably about an hour, possibly just around about four o'clock, maybe. Uh, depends how quickly I zap through this. So hopefully not too much more. I appreciate covered a heck of a lot today. Uh, some of it's going to sink in. Some of it is like, I might just come back to that later. And that's absolutely fine. Uh, no problem there. Obviously, the code is available. There is a version on the GitHub. So there's the intertrain student version, which is the version that we are using. Uh, let me just close a bunch of this stuff. Uh, there is also a intertrain version here which has got all the questions and it's got some answers in there as well, which is, uh, there we go, all the questions and then some answers. So my answers, not necessarily exactly the same ones that I've done today. So I've kind of been good. And I haven't actually referred to this, um, uh, which is which is good. Um, but yeah, there is, a, there is a version there, which has got all various different answers in there for you. Uh, so I'll just wait till... Quarter past five on the dot, just quarter past five, quarter past three on the dot. And we will continue. And so, uh, I think Zoe has gone now, so I can't keep an eye on the chat. If there are any questions, just do shout out at me. Um, and I will stop and we will we will get there. So it's quarter past. As I said, I think going forward, I'm going to aim for four, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. I think that should be fine. So just going to do some really, really basic uh, functional programming. So don't get scared by that. You've been using functions all throughout uh, this entire course. In fact, from day one, when you called the first library or you loaded your csv basically we've been using function so basically function is any word that then gets followed by um, a bracket and you chuck some data into it or whatever is a function so uh plot create ggplot is a function uh mean uh brackets is a function uh remove words that's a function squish the fabulous string squish is a function so basically, uh, those are all functions where you kind of want to do something to some data and do a thing to it. So that's awesome. And we often pull in loads of different libraries so that we can get in functions from here, there, and everywhere. But wouldn't it be amazing if you could create your own functions? So if you had a process that you were doing over and over and over again, instead of having to copy out a load of code and change one or two things in it, you could create a function and just feed that one and two things into it and run the stuff. And crazily, that is exactly what functional programming is. So basically, we're just going to create our own functions to do stuffs. Um, which just makes things really, really simple. And it means that we, you know, if we've got something where we want to do a piece of analysis for one site and then we want to do exactly the same for something else, we can create a function so we don't have to keep copying and repeating our code over and over again. And that also means if we want to tweak something in that code, and I know I've done this many any a time uh, before I got my head around functional programming, you know, if you go, oh no, that's not quite, I need to add that step into it. And then you go, oh no, I've now got to change it in five other places further down my code where I've copied and pasted it. And that way leads to mistakes and madness. So, you know, absolutely. And it's be as lazy as possible, get the computers to do all the work for us before they become our overlords. Um, and give all the or give all the work to the computer. So what we can do is build our own function. So going to start with something super super simple. Uh, hopefully, although I do use modulus, which is probably not super simple. So basically, I want to create a function where it will tell me whether a number is odd, 
or even. So basically, I just want to create a function. I'm going to feed a number into it, and it will tell me. I oh, know. I'm not even doing that, am I? Uh, no, what am I doing? I'm doing something even more complicated than that. I want to make a function where I take a number, times it by three, and then tell you whether the answer to that is odd or even. Um, so I'm going to take the number five, times it by three, and uh, hopefully get the answer of 15, and then say that's an odd number. I'm going to get my variable of y, which is 10, times that by three, get 30, and that should return odd, even. And then I'm going to, it's late. Uh, and then I'm going to feed in my z, which is 15, times it by three, which is 45, which is which is odd. Okay, so could do that in like each individual way. So I could run those and then I could do X times three, which would give me my 15 and then work out whether it's odd or even. So really, really a simple way of working out whether something is odd or even. Um, don't know why I've chucked this in here. I have no idea. I think I was doing something elsewhere on something strange and uh, this just came up so easiest way to check out whether a number is odd or even is to divide it by two and work out whether you've got a remainder or not so work out whether it's a round number or whether you've got a, um, a fraction in there um there's a really nice operator which is quite useful called the modulus operator and uh, on the modulus function which is basically two um uh, two percentage signs and uh, what a modulus operator will do is we'll do a division but instead of giving you uh the result of the division it will do a very very basic revision and then give you the remainder so if i turn that into something that makes sense so four divided by two is two five divided by two oh, goodness me five divided by two is 2.5 in traditional terms however if we did 4 modulus 2 it would be remainder is 0 whereas if we did 5 modulus 2 is 2 but remainder 1 so we're going back into much more sort of primary school maths uh, so it won't give me a 0.5, it will give me the answer of 1. So that's it gives you the remainder. So basically, if the modulus of a calculation is 0, then we can tell that it's an even number. Otherwise, it's an odd number. So it's a really, really convoluted way and probably shouldn't have added this in here because it's just way too much but i did so that's just me so we could do it all by hand so we started off with our x which we've got is five we can make an x multiplier which will be our x times three um and then look at our x mult so now we've got our 15 then we can uh do uh our 15 and do our modulus two which will hopefully give us uh, an answer of one. And then we can do a check to see whether that's a zero. So we can do an if else, if x mod is zero, then it's an even number, otherwise it's odd. And then we can run through that. And then we've got an odd, which is great. However, now if we want to do that on y, we would have to, A, first of all, we would have to set up y, we would then have to change this to Y and then we would have to run everything all over again. And then if we wanted to do it for Z, we'd have to copy that all over and then run that whole process again. So we would have to change it all the way through and it would mean lots and lots of duplicated code. And we don't want to do that because we want to we want to keep our code really, really nice and really easy. So what we can do is create our own function. So, first of all, we're going to give it a name and we're going to give it something that is useful and we can understand and we know what it's doing. So, we're going to create a function which is called is odd or even, which is pretty, pretty basic. And then we're going to assign that to a function. Uh, so, we're going to say this is odd or even is a function. 
the first operator that it needs is um, some input. So we are going to input. So our input is our variable that is going to change from from time to time. Uh, we can have one variable, we can have multiple, but for in this instance, we're going to have just an input. And then within our curly brackets, we're going to tell our function what it's going to do. So it's going to run this same thing where it's going to do its multiplier and it's going to take whatever you input and times it by three. Then it's going to multiply. It's going to do its modulus of the multiplier and return that. And then it's going to return an if else based on this modulus and it's going to either return even or odd. So if we run this, it will just uh, it will just not really do anything at this stage. However, if we look up in our global environment now, we now have got this new and exciting thing here called a function. So let's run our new function. So again, like we've done, done previously, if we've got these, uh, we've got these in here. So we've got our 10, 15 and, and whatever, and we can run our X into our function and that will come out with an answer so in this case it's running x so it's running our five so our five is going through there to be times by three to make 15 and then it's doing this little modulus thing to work out whether it's odd or even we can then also run it for our y and we can pop that in there and that will tell us we've got an even number uh, and you can also put in in a completely random number of your own choosing into our odd or even function. And that will also chuck through. So I don't know, is there any pattern to this if I do that? And then, yeah, there we go. And that will come through as an odd. So instead of having to repeat that process, we can chuck it into a function, which is which is really nice. So, um, so let's just have a play with this function. So, do, 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 so tweak the function abo above, um, so that instead of multiplying it by three, you specify what number it multiplies it by. So what we need to do, I'll just give you a little bit of a hint, is a bit of a comma, and we can have an input, uh, two or or something along those lines and then work out where you need to stick that in order to uh, multiply it by our second number uh there we go hints you can add more than one variable in a function it would be helpful if i could spell variable there we go uh so i can't spell separated either look at that separated by commas and then for bonus points uh again let's have a little bit of our paste function see if you can actually get it so that it returns a string that says x you know input times by whatever is whatever and is an even number or odd number and we'll come out with the appropriate answer
Okay, I'm just going to be mindful of time, so I will zip on. But again, do shout out if there's anything massively uh, which we're, we're skipping over. Because this stuff, I think this is like really, really amazing stuff that we can we can do now. So what we want to do is add in an additional uh, feature to our function. So we're going to have our input number and we're going to have our factor, which is what we're going to times it by. So we've got two variables now, one called input, one called factor, or fact, as I've called it. So now, instead of just by the times by three, we're going to do a malt, which will be our input times our fact. Uh, so that will be what our malt is. Our mod is still the same, so it would be whatever the, the reply, uh, result of those are. And I've done a really crazy bonkers paste statement um don't feel that you have to do that you can just stick it down to keep it to the odd or even if you want but i've done a paste and then brought through the input and then times and then the fact is and then malt which is the answer to the malt and is an and then it's got this if else which is telling us then whether it's an odd or even and then comma number my goodness me so let's just look at what that comes out with. Uh, is odd or even? And let's do something really quick. Three and two. So that'd be three times two, uh, which will be six. And then work out whether six is a odd or even number. So, so three times two is six and is an even number. So let's just try it with uh, three and three uh beyond this my maths is going to go so just just be careful so three times three is nine and is an odd number so yeah look at this amazing stuff but hopefully you can see that that is kind of a process that you can you know you can build something up what's really really nice and where we come in we can as i said this is one bit but we can create our our, our data and then we can do something completely bonkers. Let me just copy this into the chat in case you didn't get that far. Uh, there we go. So hopefully you'll have a working is odd or even function. What we can do is obviously not have that function just as a standalone thing. We can bring that into our data frame. So let's go back into here and we're just gonna create a data frame which is free function codes, type one, and we're just going to remove the breaches, uh, breaches data set. Okie dokie. So we've just got our period here and we've got admissions and uh, attendances. So absolutely bonkersly, we are going to run across our data function, uh, our data that we've just created. And we're going to mutate and we're going to create a lovely new column name, which is going to be called attend times admissions, uh, odd or even, uh, which is fabulous. And we're going to feed our is odd or even, and we're going to feed it our attendances and admissions. So row by row, it's going to times our attendances by our admissions and then come out with a Sorry, excuse me, I got hiccups out of nowhere. It's going to times our attendances by admissions and then come out with a string to tell us what the result of that calculation is and whether it's odd or even. Um, again, this probably isn't the, uh, the most useful uh, scenario that you're ever going to encounter, but hopefully you can see that you can create, you know, if you've got something that's quite convoluted, I use it a lot for things like calculating uh, population rates by, uh, by, you know, rate per 10,000, et cetera. So if I've got a very standardized thing where I've got to times that by that and then divide it by 100,000 and blah, 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 to come up with a, a, a rate, um, that's, uh, that's one way of doing it. So if I look at my data fun, now I've got this lovely new column which tells me this times this is an odd number, this times this is a, is an even number, et cetera, et cetera. So you can feed your function into just, you can just use them as a function, uh, either like as a max function, mean function or whatever. And you can make those functions as, as clever as or as, as complex as you wish. Um, it's not only... Um, 
just those sort of mathsy type things that you can do with functions. You can create uh, a functions across other things. So previously we had a nice little SPC that we were building. And so say what we, we're going to do here is make a, a little function where we want a plot, uh, a plot for a site. So we've, we're creating a load of SPCs. We've got a big report and we want to create it for specific sites. But what we don't want to do is have to repeat all this plot code over and over and over and over and over again. So basically, we're going to say our plot site, which is the name of our new function. And all we're going to feed into it is a, an, org, an org code. And then within our brackets, we're just going to get our data, which are our SPC, um, which I might need to just double check what codes we've got in there. I oh, know it's our data. Sorry, that's that's right. So our data SPC, it's just going to be our data. And we're going to filter it where the organization code is our site, which is whatever we've fed into the, the function here. And then it's just going to do all this stuff. And it's going to create us a little facet based on the type. And then it's just going to return the plot. So if we run that, in of itself, it's not going to do anything apart from create a, a new function here. But what we can do now is feed uh, different sites into our plot function. And our plot function will run through this and uh, and run it for different sites. So we can run it for our RJ1. And there we go. We've got our RJ1 plot. We can run it for our RDD. And it will create the plot for RDD. And basically, you can go through and we can feed in whichever sites that we want now. And we won't have to repeat all this code. And we've just got like one liner there that will just create our plot for us, which is which is awesome. So definitely, you know, there are definite levels of functional programming that you can go to. But something like this is just really, really super helpful because I know in the past I've done things where I've just repeated a lot of plot code. And it means if I want to change all my plots and change the point size because Simon gets annoyed with me when I use big blobby plots on there. If I can find it, because I can never remember where it is. So yeah, if I want to change it and add in my point size, da, 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 uh, where I was here, isn't it? We can add in my point size into my function, rerun my function. And now every plot that I chuck out from here on forward comes through with much nicer uh, level of, of dots. And then I only have to change it once. And if I just, for whatever reason, really want to annoy Simon, I can change that to a five and uh, have a uh, have a report with big blobs all over it. Um, and again, I only have to change that once and it will affect my whole report and really annoy myself massively. Um, okay. Um, so, so functions, good practice uh, for a function is not to call anything outside of, so basically have the function so that it only works with whatever you fed it and it's not pulling data from outside of itself. That really doesn't make sense. Maybe old Simon here made that a lot clearer. So uh, what I'm saying is, is at the moment, this function is pulling on data and the data sits outside the function. It's obviously just pulling it from the global environment. If for whatever reason that data changed, the plot function isn't going to notice. It's just going to still point at data. Um, so it, that's not it's not mentioned within the, the the function. So what is probably a good idea or what is best best practice is to make sure that you implicitly tell uh, a function all of the stuff that it needs so, so that it, it is self-contained. So in this instance, I'm just gonna add a little bit where I've got site and I'm just gonna add df equals data. And that's just gonna set uh, df as a default to data however if i wish to point it at a different data frame i could put a different data frame name in there and that would then point at a diff different data frame which also allows you to be um much more sort of specific and and yeah uh, 
I guess, more sort of dynamic around how you're working if you're working across the several data sets. So this will just pull through, work exactly the same, and it's going to set DF as our as our thing. Likewise, if we wanted to create a, a default for our site, so if we just ran this um, without any, any, any features to our plot site, uh, I've got RJ1. Yeah, so let me just... Ooh, sorry, let me just change that uh, there. So that will run for RDD. However, if I chuck it through without anything at all now, it will just revert back to the defaults, which I've put in here, which is site such and such and such and such, which is quite useful again, that you can sort of set up defaults for the uh, for the site. If I didn't have that default in there and we run this, it will basically uh, fall over because it's telling me argument site is missing with no default. So basically it won't run because it's it needs it needs to know what site it's it's running on. Okay, where are we at? We are at the final stage, the final stretch till going home time. So very, very simple for loops, which kind of tie into our function a bit very, very nicely. So a for loop is basically uh, a, a, an element that you can repeat a portion of code a number of times uh, across a number of iterations or a number of variables. I can't spell, even though it's got the nice little red line under it. Um, so, uh, what's, what's really, yeah, I'll show some examples, I guess, is the answer. So let's start off with a super sequence of numbers. So we're using the SEQ command to create us a sequence of numbers between one and 10. And hopefully you recognize those as numbers from one and 10. So say we wanted to do, um, basically we want to iterate through each of our numbers and then add five to them. So I want to I want to go through number one, and I want to add five to it. Then I want to go to number two, and I want to add five to it. And number three, and number four, and number five, etc. And rather than just doing it across the whole lot, I I kind of want to do a process across it. So it's not just the fact that I'm adding five to each of those things. It's more a case that I'm doing a a, a process. So if we look at my for loop. Um, in the most simplest terms, we've got a, a four. We've got a, a, a variable, which is called i. So this is just very, very traditional that i's are used in, in for loops. It just means for iteration. You are not um, defined to have to use i. You can use whatever you want. However, i is just the traditional method. And then basically, we're going to say i is going to be the sequence between one and ten. And then basically we're going to iterate through all the different things from i as it goes through so for the first time it will now run through this process so for the first time it iterates through i will be one so for this first section when we first run the loop as it were i will be one so it will be i plus five so it'll take one plus five will be six so it'll print five uh, one plus five equals six and print the result and then it will go through the next iteration where it will change i for the next iteration will be two. And then it'll be two plus five is whatever that is, seven, and it will print that out and it will sort of iterate around. So nothing massively complicated, but it will say one plus five equals five, then two plus five is seven, yada, yada, yada. So that's kind of a good start of the 10, I guess, for trying to understand what a loop is. That's not a very useful example. Where, uh, okay, yep, just saying. Okay, so we're, we can also make uh, more dynamic sequences. So we can look at the number of rows in our data and we could make a, a sequence of numbers that start at 50, end at the number of rows in our data and counts by 500. Um, not quite sure why we would do that and i'm not sure why this is there but we can do that so sequence is a really cool thing i don't know why that's there anyway that's kind of useful but what is much 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 more useful is that we can iterate through names and a vector um so um 
here we've created a vector of Bob, Pete, and Mary. And so basically for I in vector, we are going to paste hello and then that vector name and then print the result. So now we are going to say hello, Bob, hello, Pete, hello, Mary. Hopefully, not sure if this has blown your mind yet, but potentially what we could do is create a list of our different um, ICBs or our teams or whatever. And if we wanted to run that same a same process across each of the teams and have an output for that thing, uh, we could do that. I mean, what would also be really nice is say we had a list, we've got our charts here and we wanted to create a uh, um a bunch of charts and we had specific things that we wanted to pull through so rather than uh writing that function five times we could put that function within a loop and then iterate through uh various codes which i think we're doing in a minute so i'm jumping ahead of myself uh so yeah that's exactly what we're going to do next but i mean uh okay somebody should look at this stuff so what we can do is basically iterate through a list of different um uh, uh organization codes and basically run iterate through all of those and then build a uh, a function where we're going to run our plot function against that list that we build and then put all the results of that into a list which we can then sort of pull our our plots out of so not going to go massively into detail around lists again that's probably more advanced stuff but basically in very short terms a list is another data type um and it's the most amazing thing ever in that you can put multiple data frames in a list you can put a character in a list you can put a plot object into a list and it's just a list of stuff and you can just mix and match and just chuck everything into a list uh which is yeah a bit mind-blowing uh but i'm not gonna go to if you've used dictionaries in python they're a little bit similar however you can just chuck any old mix of junk into a single list not recommended but you can do um so let's just show what what that can do so we're going to create a plot list which is basically going to be an empty list type so now we've got up here in our global environment we've got a list of zero so there's nothing in our list we've just initiated a list we need to do that outside of our loop because if we put it inside our loop, each time we uh, ran for our loop, we would initiate the loop, you know, we'd initiate it again and we'd start it from blank. Whereas what we want to do is create a list and then within our loop, we're going to create some plots and then we're going to pop them into our list. So quite simply, we've got three uh, sites here that we want to we want to run through which is our RQ1, RJ1, and RDD. And basically we have got, uh, so this is our vector of our three sites. And we want to iterate through this vector. So the first time we're going to iterate through, I is going to be uh, RQM. Second time we run through, it, it's going to be RJ1. Then it's going to be RDD. And basically we're going to have a plot list. And then we're going to use square brackets to say to our where in our plot list we want to uh, put our thing, and we want to put it in a in a container, and we want to call it I as well. So we're just going to call it in our plot. We're going to have uh, sorry in our plot list. We're going to have a plot, and we're going to call it RQM, which means it will be really nice and easy to pull out later. And what we're going to feed into our list is basically our plot site function, which allows us to plot a site. And we're going to run through that and create a list which will have three plots in it. And then if we want to, we can pull those plots out of that list and use them where we want them. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So for I in vector, it will run through and we run through that biggie, biggie, biggie. We do get some warnings, um, not to worry about that. It's a little bit how lists work. Lists like to be of a specified size and it complains a little bit if we uh, add stuff to an empty list. That's quite bad form. When you create a list, you should say how big it is to start with. Otherwise, potentially, if you're working with really big lists, it can uh, do lots of horrible things to, to memory. But 
for what we're doing, it's it's not too much of a problem. So now we've got a plot list. And if we look at our plot list and we, we just run that one, we can pull out from our list our plot. Um, likewise, we can pull out uh, another one. In this scenario, I mean, obviously, that's not much different from just calling the plot site function, but it's just kind of showing potentially what, what we could do with uh, a for loop. Um, and you can also call a plot from its position within the list. So we can say we want the first plot from our list or the second or the third or whatever. If we really wanted to, we could create a vector which was based on all the unique organization codes within our data, uh, which would give us all of the organization codes. And then we could feed that vector into our for loop. And basically it would then create us a massively long list with 274 uh, individual plots in it, um, which we could then pull out as we wanted to from one object. Um, and it allow us to do that sort of more dynamically. Um, and my goodness me uh according to this we're pretty much there blimey i think that's pretty much as much as i want to blow your minds for today um yeah obviously got a bit of time if there's any questions or queries comments or whether you just want to rock backwards and forwards and cry a bit all of those are acceptable um i've got a question simon yep um around um yeah all about about this loop stuff if i wanted to so i've got a section of code that i want to run at different aggregation levels so for england and then for every region and then at icb level and then at site level yep. um what would be the best so on creating that defined are they defined within different columns so you've got one that says region then you've got one that says icb and one that says provider something like that yeah so it would end up building up a kind of a you know one of those horrible tables that yeah yeah everything could, but yeah could put whatever your analysis that you're doing into a function and then iterate through each of those and then feed your function that it reads first it does it by yeah, I'm just trying to think of a quick and easy example of how to do that. But yeah, you could then feed it. So it runs it by region and then by this and then by that and then cobbles it all together. Yeah, so that is possible. And that, um, would you build a vector like you showed? Yeah, so you could to kind of build up a new list of. And you could just build up around which columns you want to then group it by, as it were, because you want to group, you want to do it by the regions and then by the um, ICBs and then by provider or whatever it is. Yeah, you could say, and then you could run that analysis because you're running the same thing. You're just doing it at different aggregation levels, aren't you? Yeah. So it would, your, would be kind of what you would feed into your group by, I guess. So whether you would be grouping it by the regions or then the next bit would be grouping it by the um, ICBs and then the next bit would be grouping it by the uh, individual providers. Yeah. So, yeah. That, um, that. So a little bit trickier, and I probably I can show you outside of here. So if you want to, so where are we? Let me just jump up. Here, where have we got a group by? Just trying to think. So normally, I'll just find something here. So normally, if you had, uh, and you would specify here your column name. So we've got, I don't know, org code, which would be the equivalent. If you want to have that as something dynamic within a, so you're grouping by different columns, there is a way that you can do that. And it's a little bit, it's not quite as straightforward as just feeding it in through from the, let's let's do an example. Now let's just not mess it about. Right. So uh, group by, uh, so what have we got here? 
we've got our data and we are selecting the period and the org code is that right yeah okay so we want to group by and that's where we want our x so, and we want to do uh summarize uh n so we want to write a function where we can either group it by the period and it will tell us how many entries we've got per period or we want to group it by the organization code and it will group give us then the number by organization code yeah does that make sense yeah. so that's essentially what we are doing so that's our that's our little bit of what we want to do so we want to do our group by function uh which is our function and then our variable which we want to feed in so the variable in this case is the actual column name so uh so we do call name and then that's our function and we want it to run and do that. Uh, yeah. So basically, where we've got our call name, we uh, well, one of that is group by, didn't we? Sorry. There, that will not quite work. Well, it worked there, but when we actually try to run it, oh, go away. Uh, right. So we've got our group by. And we want to group it by period. Yeah, it will fall out because it can't find that call name in the data. So what we need to tell it is that that call name is not in the data. It's the name of the column. So don't ask me why, but we put a, it's called a bang bang. And it's two exclamation marks to say that we're going to group this by this column name. So now when we run that, we should get, we can either group it. Is that not right? Have I done it the wrong way around? Let's just do that. Uh, period. Let's not call them new names because that's just going to be annoying. Uh, oh, joy. What have I done here? Error in group by. What have I done there? Argument X must be a vector and not a function. Ah, is it because call name is a. Thing. No. What's going on there then? Um, ah, there. That's probably it. There we go. Right. So, uh, so now I've grouped it by period. So it's done that. Or if I wanted to group it now by org code, I could run that function again and it would count the number of org code, total of org code. That makes sense. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> I'll to, to, to follow up with you. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But essentially, you can group it by different things. I mean, this isn't probably the best this example um, because we haven't actually got any attendances or anything in there. Um, but yeah, so you can tell it to group by different things. So you can choose different columns. So yeah, potentially you could have it that I could then put this org code and period into a loop and then put my group by function fun in there and it would do it by one thing and then it would do by the next thing or whatever mm -hmm. and you could potentially uh, create a data frame and each time it runs for the iteration you could do a bind rows instead of pop popping it into a list so that you run it by the um the region 
and then you run it by the ICB. And when it runs it on the ICB, it will bolt it onto the bottom. And then when you run it onto the providers, it will then bolt that onto the bottom of the data set. So you have one data set. And as you run through each iteration, it sort of bolts it on the bottom. So that whole bind rows stuff starts coming in kind of handy. Yeah, this sounds like I definitely need to follow up with more questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Happy to. Thank you. Oh. Any other questions or queries? Do you please which, shout. Which is your favorite book on R? What's my favorite book on R? Um, I definitely would recommend the R for Data Science, the the absolute classic uh, Hadley R Wicker. R for Data Science, you said. Okay. Yes, Even though it says for data science, it's it's not really. It's well, there's a little bit at the end which goes a little bit into linear models and stuff, but the the first three quarters of the book just covers a lot of tidyverse stuff in in quite good depth. So. I don't know. I think my favorite book is Stack Overflow, to be honest, and Google. <laughs> That's where I get most of my uh, most of my answers from. I, yeah, I don't really, I don't know. I don't think I've read. I think I flicked through it. I don't think I've actually read it. Maybe I should do. Silly question. Go for it, Martin. Very silly question. Uh, on the um, class number yes. bit earlier, um, Within the function, you're doing the NA equals uh, NA or nothing. What does that do? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I looked at that and went, what the heck is that doing? Um, where are we? Parse. Uh, row 1027, I think, thereabouts. Have I got nothing in there? Doesn't make sense. I wasn't sure what that was doing. No, I'm not sure what that's doing, actually. Uh, so, I does it need two things, or do I just need an a NA? Uh, does it need anything? So that's all right. Does it even need anything at all? Uh, what have I done there? I missed a. Missed a. So if I look at my data org code numbers, where that's still pulled through NAs. I don't know why I've put that in there is the short answer. So let's have a look what pass number says for itself. NA, a character vector of strings to interpret as missing values. Um, yeah, so it absolutely looks like I nixed the version from here. Um, ah, so let's have a look at what. Yeah, I definitely nixed the version from here. I think that's my problem. So there we go. So if I've got a character string and I've got uh, one, two, and three, and I've got uh, NA and I've got nothing, and I want to absolutely convert my nothing into an NA, I can specify here that an NA is nothing. So yeah, that's me copying a bit of code without actually understanding it properly. So that's actually quite helpful, to be honest, looking at that, that could be useful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, read the documentation properly is uh, what I need to do. <laughs> but yeah, ask those stupid questions because then we can pull those things out. That's really good. Thanks, Simon. As I said, this is the first time I've run this course. I mean, timing looks pretty bloody impressive, um, if nothing else. Um, genuinely, we're really, really interested. I mean, how are you guys feeling? Was it was it whiz through? It felt like I was going very, very fast. And I apologize for that. Was it okay to keep up? Or were there a couple of bits? It's like, whoa. And you can be... Me, 
for me it was a little bit fast if I need to do the the exercise, but that's just personally me. That means that the other uh, were in, the others may have done much better than I did. Yeah. It's very hard to judge, and obviously it would be much nicer if we were all in a room together, and I could look over shoulders and uh, yeah. see where people were, etc., and get a bit more of a feel of the room. But, but hopefully, like I say, you've got access to uh, the GitHub. Um, we will send that out again. But within that GitHub, there is the intertrain. I probably need to put like teacher version on it or something, and. Um, that has got all the answers to all the, or an answer, not the answer, it has got an answer to each of those those things. So if you want to go back and uh, see how I did it, um, yeah, more than happy to for you guys to have a look at that. Um, yeah, and like I say, going forward, would love to do um, something around sort of tables and um, how to pull up data tables. And there's probably some more stuff we can do on plots and bits and pieces, but yeah, other than that, um, I think we're pretty much there. Are there any other sort of final bits and pieces, anybody? Speak now or forever hold your peace or whatever it is. Nope. Thanks, I, Simon. It's been really yeah. useful. Thanks, Simon. Okay, other than that, uh, if any of you are at the R conference in a couple of weeks, I will be there and uh, talking. Um, just to say there is a bit of a shout out that uh, probably a bit of a spoiler that we are running a coffee and code session, um, which is every two weeks. At the moment, it's NHS England, but we are opening it out wider. Um, so basically, there is like an hour session. I think it's on a Friday morning, 11 till 12. Um, I can send out details once we've got those sorted out a little bit. And we do a little bit of show and tell, a little bit of function of the week that we found and anything else that we uh, sort of come up with or or anything we sort of can cover within an hour. And just that hopefully a, a nice place where people can either share funky things that they found or if they've got any sort of specific questions where they are. I don't know where the video will be linked as yet. That will, uh, Zoe will sort that out and I think she will sort of, so I think you all guys will get sent a link to where that is. Uh, when can we expect the, the tables courses when I get around to writing them? Um, so yeah, I will, uh, yeah, I will do that at some point, probably not in the immediately in the near future, but hopefully before Christmas, I'll put something together and whether not, probably not a full day, but possibly like a, it's like three or four hours, we can either do like a morning or an afternoon and try to do some more stuff on tables. This course was massively overbooked. So I sold out, which was awesome. And, uh, people want to do it again. So this is the first time I've run it in this sort of format. I kind of ran it and run some of the bits. And I think Martin, you were on the sort of the, the early version, the, the very much the beta version. Uh, this is a sort of the, the first time I've run it like this. So again, any feedback is really, really helpful because uh, other people might be uh, subjected to the same course. So if there's any bits where it's like, slow down on this bit, or can you just go in a bit more detail here, here and here? That's that's really helpful and obviously just helps improve the course going forward. Other than that, I am going to finally stop talking because I've had enough of my voice. God knows how you guys feel. Um, and we'll wish you all very well. Um, I think you probably know where to contact me. If you don't, it's just simon.wellensymiller at nhs.net. I'm sure there'll be some follow-up course materials. Um, my GitHub's there. You obviously should contact me through that uh etc etc and i will finally shut up at uh eight minutes past 